Okay, the meeting is now being recorded. We also have the opportunity for those um, who uh, request Spanish simultaneous interpretation. There should be a little option at the bottom. Um, so you can click on Spanish and the interpreters are in the room. And if we could um, please ask everyone to um, keep their microphones and videos muted uh, during public comments. If you have signed up for public comment, um, we can unmute you, um, but only then. Thank you. Great, thank you, Sarah. So we, we do have four board members. Well, we have five board members here now, so great. So we will open the meeting. We have, uh, I see Maria, is Ralph here yet? No, Ralph is here too, great. All seven board members are here. We'll call the meeting to order. I'll invite everybody, if they choose, to rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. If you want to unmute yourself, feel free. If you want me to do it by myself, that's fine too. Place your hand over your heart and begin. I pledge allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I think that was me and Devon Smith doing a duet there. So thank you, Devon. Oh, wasn't Devon Smith? Richard Murphy, how you doing? Okay, thank you, Chris Murphy. I appreciate the duet. Um, Great, which brings us to approval of the, oh, I have one thing to read out from closed session. Uh, DN 1007-2021, final settlement agreement. Kindly note that the summary of the settlement is as follows. The district agrees to fund IEE in areas of psychoeducation and speech and language for up to $12,000. The district shall fund 85 hours of after-school services by non-public agency approximately $11.9,000. And the district agrees to reimburse legal, uh, parent legal fees at the cost of $7,000. Motion by uh, board member Metcher, seconded by board member Tavilder and Jessman. Uh, vote was six to zero. Uh, board member De La Torre arrived right at the end of that vote. So it was six to zero. That brings us to approval of the agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda as submitted? So moved by Maria, seconded by Craig. Uh, so quick roll three, call vote. Richard? So three, yes. No functioning. Uh, yes. Lori? Great, Craig. Ralph? Don't listen in Spanish. Hands up, Maria, hands up, Craig. And Oscar? Yes. Great, so the uh, When you're all done, John, I apologize. The translation doesn't seem to be working at the moment. Hold on oh, one second. Okay, well, the agenda is approved. Uh, so why don't we figure out the translation now? Okay, I have one translator in the room. It shows. Apologize, everyone. We're just making sure. If Vanina is on, I don't see you, Vanina, as logged in with your name. Hi, Sarah. I am a it's Spanish interpreter, BC. Can you hear me? Yes, I, I can hear you. I just don't see you on the list. I, um, I'll change my name back to my name. Okay, One sorry moment. about that. That's okay. Can you see me now? It's so weird, it's not coming up. Hold on, let me. Sí, te escuchamos, Vanina, gracias. De nada, disculpe la, la molestia. Please hold. Pero ya escuchamos ahora sí la interpretación. They're, they are listening to it, Sarah. Oh, no, but I, oh, no, 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 I, they hear my audio like everybody else hear me, oh, okay. but um, I have not been assigned yet. Oh, okay. It's not recognizing you in. Okay, so um, I'm going to very quickly stop tra translation and then bring it right back. Okay. Um, let's do end. I apologize, everyone, for a little technical difficulty. So strange, it doesn't see you. Should I leave the room and come back? Why don't you try that? I'll keep an eye out for you. I think Suzanne is in the room, so I will. Okay. I think she is. Let's see. Oh, hold on. Let's see if this works. She is in the room. Yes. Okay. Okay. So I'll leave and come back. Sorry, everyone. 
eh, perdonen por eh, el problema de, de comunicación. Okay, so if someone is in the translation room, um, and we'll try to get the second interpreter in there as well. Sorry, John, go ahead. Okay, great. No, no worries. Let's, let's make sure we get it right. Um, let's, we have two sets of minutes to approve. If there is no one who wants to pull anything out or make any amendments, I would ask for a motion to approve both sets of minutes, August 13th, August 25th. So moved. Moved by Maria. I see a second by Craig. Uh, roll call vote. Uh, Richard? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Lori? Yes. Ralph? Yes. Craig? Yes. Maria? Yes. Oscar? Yes. And I am a yes also, so that it's seven yeses. I assume I caught everybody. I didn't count while I did that. Great. Which takes us, so are we, are we good, um, Sarah Warrenbrock, with our translation? I see both translators in the room. Thank you. Then let's go to our study session. We have a timestamp for seven, which gives us plenty of time for other things. So let's go to our study session. Uh, personalized project-based learning update. Uh, Dr. Moore, are you introducing? Yes, I am. President. Wonderful. Take it away. Thank you so much. Good evening, um, board president, members of the board, Dr. Drotty, cabinet and guests. It's a pleasure for me to be able to introduce um, our Samuel Heiss personalized project-based learning update um, for this year. And to facilitate these conversations, we have our Coordinator of Learning and Innovation, Dr. Devon Smith, and our um, PPBL, um, Samuel High Pathway Principal, Ms. Jessica Risch, who is also here to provide um, some insight um, in relationship to the work that's been taking place. Hello, everyone. I uh, want to say hello um, specifically to President Keene and to the board, to Dr. Jody and his cabinet and all who are here. I'll start sharing my screen. As Dr. Moore said, I am Dr. Devon Smith and I coordinate learning and innovation for the district. Um, hopefully we're seeing the right screen. Are we seeing Sam High's personalized? Are we seeing it? Great, fantastic. Pardon me one moment. Okay. Um, so uh, as she mentioned, <clears throat> uh, I am here with um, Jessica Risch, who is the principal and uh, Nicole Nicodemus, who is the assistant principal. And this is our personalized project-based learning pathway, uh, which is a part of Santa Monica High School. It is a program within the high school and it's located at the Obama Center. Um, tonight, I'm gonna be reporting on our data collection process, um, our response to that feedback, as well as the recruitment process that we had last year leading into this year and our enrollment and then some shifts that have occurred um, due to the pandemic and to um, some of the injustices. And um, that is what I will be sharing tonight. I wanna start with um, just some of the salient pieces really come back to just the student's voice. This is about student voice and choice. Um, this past year, or excuse me, last year, the students there got a chance to put together a book where they shared their voice around some of the um, issues that were relevant to them. Uh, they explored their personal histories and ambitions and dreams, and they reached out to the community, community to investigate. And they put together a project called We Are America. Um, they published the website and the book, as you see there. This is a student who spoke about um, the cultural relevance behind her tattoos and how, how her tattoo was um, something she learned about her culture through. Um, so this is, these are powerful reads. This is just a taste of what the students get a chance to do. They get to engage. They get to engage in um, the relevance of learning. They get to engage in their, their culture. They get to engage in just depth of learning. And so this is uh, one of the projects that they had. So just to kick us off there. I want to take us back to uh, Dr. Noguera uh, about five or six years ago when he did our study in our district. And uh, this is a slide that we've seen, but I just wanted to put it out there out front. He said, for over 20 years, our district has undertaken a number of initiatives to address and reduce racial and socioeconomic economic disparities in student achievement. However, for a variety of reasons, none of these efforts have reduced these disparities in student achievement or produce significant or sustainable improvements in academic outcomes. For African-American and Latino students, 
uh, English language learners, children with learning disabilities, and low-income students generally in the school district. So we needed to respond to this. He pointed out a few things here. He pointed out uh, that there was a lack of consistent implementation uh, across our systems, our structures. Um, he pointed out that uh, we uh, needed to eliminate these academic disparities and that uh, we were contributing to an inconsistent and varied expectations for teaching and learning, which, which is not good. We wanted to make sure that we addressed that, the isolation and fragmentation. Um, he also talked about the, um, uh, the lack of coherence and cohesive focus centered around teaching and learning and its desire to uh, advance equity at our schools. And for many of our sites, there was a culture of opposition among staff uh, in terms of leading the change. Well, in this particular uh, effort, we really leaned into um, this, this uh, notion of lack of buy-in. Uh, we believe that project-based learning is an opportunity for deeper engagement, not just for the students, but for the teachers as well. Personally, um, having been a classroom teacher for 12 years, I engaged in projects and I'm telling you, it, I, I got to experience the depth of learning, not just for my, my students, but for myself as well. And it really did bring engagement to the forefront and um, gave students an opportunity to have a depth of learning. The other uh, thing we want to do is we want to advance equity. Um, we wanna create access, we wanna create these on-ramps for students. And we believe that the personalized project-based learning approach is ideal for this. And then came our common message. And in that common message, uh, we po we're pointing out that we're trying to make students college and career ready. Uh, as I've said before in other presentations, um, it's about both. It, it can't just be about college because even when we graduate from college, we need a career. So um, an opportunity in personalized, pro personalized project-based learning gives students an opportunity to uh, explore their passions and pursue them while they're in school. Um, so this is very important. So we really do seek in this pathway to create college and career ready students through relevant and real world instruction. Uh, we also are seeking socially responsive students through community based projects and then academic rigor. These opportunities in academic rigor that call students to ideate, to analyze, to synthesize, to fail fast as the business world knows, to reflect and revise and to collaborate to address real world problems. Um, in short, to create great purpose, to create the why in school for so many of our students. And then um, this project-based learning is in uh, direct fulfillment of the board's direction from two years ago. Uh, we theorize that uh, the program and its maturity will deepen students' learning, lower the numbers on the main campus, uh, which would produce uh, greater outcomes there, uh, provide a district center of excellence around PBL instruction and become a model for other districts desiring to create similar pathways. In short, this is our deep approach. So if you were to look at those four tenants, um, you would see that professional development would be our wide approach where this is not just about uh, providing project-based learning experiences for one, um, uh, one program, but this is about spreading it throughout the entire district. So we have a wide approach and then the fourth one, that secondary pathway is our deep approach. And this was built off the bright spots that we uh, unearthed in, in, our, in our district by talking with students and site administrators. So, and then the other two are CTE and then of course, creating these high tech career labs. But I did wanna point out again, the deep and the wide approach. And then this, um, this slide uh, carries the slogan, do, learn, thrive. Project-based learning is really about learning through doing. It's not about let's learn things in isolation and then let's do a project. Uh, this, is, this is a center where they really are learning through the actual project. And this quote down at the bottom is very important from a student. I've been learning a lot with hands-on activities 
and feel more engaged. And that's key because that's what we're getting to, especially from the Nagara report. Engaged in learning. And I feel like learning is really fun because of all these projects. So what a great testimony from a student. If a student says that they had fun and learned, that's a great situation. And that's what we wanna create those experiences. So in our infancy, last year uh, was the first year. Uh, it's a new experience. Um, many, uh, many students were not used to this. Um, there were so many different reasons, but we, we couldn't just guess. We wanted to know what were the reasons why there was lower than expected enrollment. So our purpose is here. We wanted to understand uh, why the students who had committed, because we had a uh, hundred plus that had um, expressed interest and, and, and so many were committed to enrolling in the pathway, but ultimately they did not enroll. And we wanted to find that out. Uh, we also wanted to find out uh, areas in the pathway that were causes for great celebration, which we could be, which we could highlight and we could use for further recruitment. And also we wanted to know what were the areas that we can improve in, of course. And then this was our data uh, collection and analysis. Uh, survey data was collected from 18 parents. That was approximately 34% of the population of students who did not enroll in the PPBL, as well as from 29 students who were there. That's about 71% of that population from last year that were in the pathway. And additionally, we had eight current students participating in a focus group. And so finally, we analyzed all that data and we determined the themes surrounding parent and student expectations, their attitudes and satisfactions level, satisfaction levels concerning the pathway. And then finally, with those findings, we shared it with the site and the district leadership uh, to determine the next steps. And site leadership had already incorporated so much, so much of this feedback uh, through their own efforts. And so they already had this in motion and we put that together for these improvement efforts for the 2019-20 uh, uh, school year and the recruitment ac activities moving forward into this year. So that's just a little bit of background on um, the researching of those issues. And now I'd like to share that response to the feedback. So um, already uh, perceiving areas of support from other forms of feedback, the staff, as I said, had already begun um, implementing some improvement efforts for that particular current year. So this slide communicates the efforts responding to all the forms of feedback, but it was organized into three major areas highlighted uh, in my summary uh, analysis. Um, so those three areas were enrollment hindrances. So that's what you see on this screen and the next two screens will go into curriculum improvement and communication needs. So um, going over hindrances to enrollment. So on the left, we have the feedback uh, just kind of summarized there and then the response from the site. So uh, a, a number of parents had said, um, my kids' friends aren't at the school. They won't be going. So I didn't want to separate, and my, my child didn't want to separate from their friends. That's understandable. Some people had uh, a narrative that project-based learning is not rigorous. So why would I want to send my uh, child to a program uh, that I perceive would not be rigorous? So again, that was the perception. Uh, some people um, verbalized in so many ways that they didn't want their um, uh, students being away from the campus, from the main campus, um, or they might have had an issue uh, with um, uh, the, the former um, Olympic High School uh, still being there. I don't know, but those were some of the things that were said that they didn't want their students attending at that campus. Also, there was a perception that if I uh, if my child goes there, they won't be able to participate in this particular program at the high school. Um, it turned out that that was not the case. Students participated in baseball, basketball, football, water polo, golf, cheer, volleyball, uh, track, swimming, pep rallies, clubs. So they, got a, they actually got an opportunity to do so much more than originally expected. So um, be that as it is, these were uh, the reported hindrances to finally um, um, showing up at the pathway. The response was here on the right. Um, so many people attended the tours this past uh, school year before the shutdown. We had 200 families. Um, however, um, as, um, as COVID set in here for us, uh, the last 50 could not attend. So they had to do virtual um, options. 
um, they had powerful exhibitions which showcased the rigor and the relevance with their immigration project and with their um, um, mission, uh, mission to Mars. And I'm sorry, Jessica and Nicole, if I botched that up, please clean it up on the back end. But just these powerful projects where um, uh, there was a, a, just so much depth and engagement around those and the power of their learning in their STEM and in their humanities blocks. So the rigor was there and the relevance was there. Um, positive parent comments about the Obama Center during the tour where so many people might not have ever been down to that campus and saw how, uh, how, how wonderful and beautiful and serene that that campus really is. Uh, positive, um, uh, actually, let me move on to uh, the students were uh, well connected to Samuel High's community. As I said, so many participated in these other activities and they got a chance to do lunch twice a week on the campus. So uh, they did respond to the feedback they did make changes in the, um, in the schedule and they did accommodate students' needs around here. They also had a fantastic robotics club that was hosted there. Um, a group of parents um, um, helped um, uh, come together uh, with a marketing consultant who did this at no cost. Um, and they worked on the branding, they worked on an elevator, elevator pitch proposal and a promotional video, which is on the site right now. And it's uh, very descriptive very inspiring, and uh, I would encourage everyone to look at that. Now we'll move on to the curriculum and the communication. So some of the feedback uh, was um, how amazing the iLab, and that stands for the Innovation Lab, which was a makerspace, tinkerspace, um, innovation space um, that was really outfitted with industry level equipment um, where students did high quality um, projects in that space. And we had a parent volunteer who um, donated the materials and her time and uh, helped to make that uh, a real highlight. And the students pointed that out. They loved that. They also loved the fact that this was one of the first times in their K-12 experience where they've had student voice and choice, where they had um, uh, you know, agency over their learning. Um, and they also pointed out that they loved being able to demonstrate their learning. Okay. Um, they were interested in having more interest-based leaving to learns. Those, um, some people might look at them as field trips. They are not. They're experiences to uh, targeted areas uh, with industry professionals that teach them about the pathway towards that, um, that industry. Well, the students wanted it to be a little bit more interest-based specifically to them. So they restructured that. And I think it's a, it's a powerful strength. It's a highlight to have a staff that is willing to be flexible and pivot. And so when we say student voice and choice, they actually really do mean student voice and choice. So there's a lot of structure, but they incorporate um, uh, enough flexibility to make those pivots to make the learning as powerful as possible because that messages to a young student. And so um, uh, they also pointed out that the STEAM block at that time, first semester, was not meeting their expectations. However, that changed second semester. Um, the first semester uh, project was focused on the humanities block. The second semester where uh, they had to set up a, a, a colony um, in Mars, uh, that was focused on the, on the STEAM. STEAM block. So uh, some responses on the side. Um, uh, we knew that we needed to get a sustainable model for the innovation lab. We had talked about that a few times um, uh, during the year. These leaving to learns, they shifted uh, to be more individualized and interest driven, as I mentioned. Um, they continued to hold those virtual leaving to learns during this distance learning. So in the spring, they didn't miss a beat. They just had these um, industry professionals log on to Zoom and it was every bit as powerful. Um, the internship program is now in, de in, in development. That's gonna benefit uh, the entire district. It's really um, the learning through interest. It's a pre-internship program, but it teaches them all of those skills to help the students set up those, um, be a part of setting up those internships in the future um, through their own passions that they take more agency in that, which is of course another powerful model. 
um, they are in site collaboration with Olympic High School. The plan was never uh, to create uh, this experience and then not um, boost the experiences for Olympic High School. So there's collaboration there where we're elevating um, uh, project-based learning for all. Uh, they changed their semester schedule uh, to, to uh, be able to accommodate students who were really feeling like they wanted greater connection with the main campus. They did that. And so they went to twice a week. And then they launched their multidisciplinary project incorporating genetics, eugenics, TED Talks uh, during the distance learning. So again, these powerful pivots are happening even in our time of COVID. Then the, in terms of the communication, the feedback that we got from our research was that um, students were underinformed, right? The, when I say the students, I'm talking about the student, um, the student body at the time, um, and that students were wanting more selective enrollment, more, um, more um, uh, input into the enrollment process. Uh, because they realized, wow, we're all in this together and we wanna make sure everyone has a shared uh, engagement and everyone really wants uh, this style of learning. Um, so they responded even before the feedback. Um, they created a student leadership group and they met every Wednesday and they, provide, um, they provided valuable feedback. And so they created that feedback loop. Um, they developed community. Those students were leading activities and meetings. They had input into policy and they served as ambassadors, which was a powerful uh, role for them to play because there's nothing like hearing about um, a school site's experience than hearing it from the actual students. And they gave the tours and the orientations. And um, so I'll move on. And uh, this, this is a, a slide centered around the recruitment efforts uh, for last year. And they incorporated that feedback and had a lot of success. Uh, so they gave presentations to the eighth graders over 30% interest um, at um, uh, Lincoln and also at JAMS. Uh, they had full capacity attendance to all the parent meetings at JAMS, Lincoln and um, Malibu Middle School, full capacity for two sessions at the Samuel High Experience. I was there myself and there were people outside the halls, uh, in the halls and we had to pull other people and teachers to kind of give them orientations because they couldn't get into the other room. So there was a, there was a lot of interest that had been generated. Um, featured current studi students. Uh, we had that promotional video and our branded brochures. So um, parents really got a sense of the power of the program through all of these different, um, different avenues. Uh, tours, they had 200 people signed up. And as I mentioned, they had to have a number of people um, switch to a virtual uh, uh, situation because they were postponed due to the closures. Um, our timing was good. Uh, compared to the year before. As you know, we were really trying to put that out. Uh, we had a lot more time. They got a chance to, um, to, uh, to uh, have an impact on those who were thinking about local private schools. Uh, and we had 105 applications. And then uh, we had virtual orientation meetings uh, in English and in Spanish and student-led and administrative-led uh, tours. We had student ambassadors. So this was uh, a, a kind of a, a quick summary of what their um, outreach efforts were like. Now the enrollment, and um, this is current. So applications received as of um, earlier last month, there were 105. We had 51 incoming ninth graders originally enrolled and six disenrolled for various reasons um, having to do with COVID. You had uh, parents who um, um, had a reduction in their employment, had to move out of the area. So these were disenrolled in, uh, in the district. 74 students are currently enrolled right now in terms of ninth and 10th grade. Uh, there was better timing, as I mentioned. Uh, the tours, I've mentioned that. Um, one of the things that was a very big focus this year is making sure that families understood that this needed to be the student's decision. Um, this, is a, this is an approach. We believe in this approach, but for some, uh, that might not be their chosen path. They might want um, something that is more teacher-directed over student-centered. And so um, that's fine. Uh, we wanted to make sure that each student that enrolls is here not because their parents are pushing them, but they're here because this is the type of education 
that really speaks to them and to their heart. And so that was a huge um, talking point. That was a huge push during our, um, our, uh, our outreach. So we wanted them to have student agency over parent selection. Um, we anticipated that some students from last year would opt out and return to the main campus in 10th grade due to that desire for more teacher-directed instruction. Um, and that's not a slam, uh, that's just a, a, a statement of fact. Uh, some would have a, a different choice. And we, of course, knew that there would be some that would exit because parents would no longer be um, uh, prodding uh, those students to, to attend. So these were those realities. So what I have here is our uh, demographics in comparison. So by cohort, so this was on the left uh, last school year. These were the um, ninth graders. And then on the right, these are the ninth graders currently. And so um, really wanted to point out to the board um, that we have a few more this year, uh, 41, and this year we have 45. Uh, we have some things that remain consistent and some areas that have increased. Um, one of the things I think we can point out is that um, our special ed uh, has increased uh, from 12% to 31. So we are definitely serving that population. Um, our English proficiency is uh, for ELs roughly around the same as last year. Um, and for our English only roughly around the same. Um, so I'll let you just kind of see that for a moment. And then this slide shows our demographics uh, for this year combined for ninth and 10th graders. So this is the current situation. Those are 74 students, as you see here. Um, we have um, the reported race at the top, um, uh, SED students as reported, our special ed, and our English proficiency. Now I want to share just a little bit about some of the shifts, the pivots um, that uh, have occurred uh, due to um, the pandemic, uh, social injustice and other uh, issues. Uh, first off, I want to report that there's been a reduction in general ed teachers. There was four uh, last year that has now gone to three general ed teachers. So population has increased a little bit, but we've reduced uh, the amount of general ed teachers there. Our AP, uh, Nicole Nicodemus, is teaching two sections of freshman seminar also. So I would say the staff is really, um, is really stretching to make sure that this works. Um, and so I'm happy to report that. Uh, the Innovation Lab, we are not ignoring that. Uh, right now, it's empty. Um, no one can use it uh, because of distance learning right now. So it is empty. There is nothing there, however. Our volunteer is still on hand and serving uh, as a mentor for projects in the virtual space. And um, we are working on plans for when we're able to come back uh, to have that uh, space uh, leveraged by community partnerships. So um, not looking for that to be a, a burden uh, district wise. Now I would like to invite um, uh, Jessica Rich and Nicole Nicodemus uh, to share about the, the response to the pandemic and the social injustice in terms of uh, projects that are happening right now or the overall project that's happening right now um, and a little bit about their calendar and how that fits. Um, Jessica or will it be Nicole? Uh, Jessica first. Okay. Hello, I'm Jessica Risch and I wanted to explain to you how our schedule aligns with the SAML High Time Blocks so that our students can flow from their PPBL courses into their SAML High electives. The difference is how we're using the time blocks. So for example, for the first project of this year, we're combining core classes, core content classes, so that ninth and 10th graders are working together for this first month. And they're participating in an integrated curricular project, as well as a parallel math workshop 
as they build student student, student um, connections and culture in our pathway together. Uh, next slide. Our staff and students started witnessing and experiencing in the spring health challenges and social and racial injustices and we knew we wanted and needed to launch this school year with a project that was really relevant to everyone in the community. So the PPBL staff spent the summer planning and our opening essential question for our project is how can we address the inequalities in society revealed and exacerbated by a pandemic. So within this larger context, students have autonomy to select topics of interest related to the inequalities around them. And our students have chosen to dive into studies around um, apartment evictions, essential worker designations, prison populations, racial inequities in the healthcare system, homelessness, the Black Lives Matter movement, and uh, young kids who are losing social skills or might be losing social skills with remote learning. The, um, the project is structured around skill development through a series of workshops that we feel are essential in any rigorous, meaningful project. So workshops so far, these first two weeks have included media literacy, safety as digital citizens, and interviewing skills all of which that they can then take those workshop lessons back into their own personal project. And I'd like to introduce the co-administrator for this uh, pathway, Nicole Nicodemus. Thank you, Jessica. Devon, you can move to the next slide. <laughs> so um, students have time uh, for research during the school blocks with access to teachers for one or two different blocks each day. And they're, they're um, involved in either skill building sort of workshops and or kind of an independent um, kind of study research into their investigative um, project. They, we are incorporating um, English, science, history um, into this project as well as math. They had a, a, a lesson on statistics and how to read data and chart um, of COVID-19, which are um, prevalent in, in a lot of our um, current news. Um, so one of the district's PBL goals and ours is to connect students um, to the real world via community experts. And as Devon has already sort of mentioned, um, we started doing it uh, in March with bringing in um, experts and having um, workshops be available to students and definitely for this project we're bringing in community experts virtually so that we hope that our our guest experts start to develop relationships with students and students develop relationships with these mentors um, and build that relationship so that um, they might later on be able to continue to learn and be mentored from them um, students self-select to sign up for these various speakers. Next week, we have a vaccine specialist coming in, a social worker to help us understand mental health related um, to social injustice, um, food injustice, community farmers. Um, we have a hip hop educator looking at music as a response to social injustice. <clears throat> Devon. Um, the milestones or evidence of learning that students will all have to do, even though their, their project topics might be all different, um, really centers around coming up with what their potential solution is to address the social inequality after they've identified and understood the problem through their inquiry process. Um, some students might pursue this uh, solution through the year for the independent project and earn credit through the newly approved LTI course or through service learning projects. Um, others might move on to different areas of interest for their personal project second semester, but our goal is that through this inquiry process, they're really building the skills and self-confidence and self-efficacy um, to be successful as we move into deeper and deeper projects as the year continues. Thank you very much. Um, actually, Nicole or Jessica, I would love for you to speak on this particular um, um, uh, slide. We will not be able to show the video right now. I think we're kind of running out of time, but um, this 
brings it back full circle uh, in terms of the student voice, the student choice, this opportunity to analyze and get deep into the curriculum and uh, show what they've learned. Um, can I have, Jessica, would you mind uh, sharing a little more in depth on this one? So first, shout out to Matthew for um, giving us permission to uh, share part of his presentation of learning. And I'm sorry, Matthew, that your video won't be shared. Uh, but at the culmination of uh, each semester, the students have a chance to uh, share in front of a panel of their peers and mentors and staff, as well as their parents or guardians, um, how they've met their learning goals um, for that semester and artifacts or evidence about how they've done that as well as places where um, they got stuck and things that they can work on. So this was a piece from Matthew's presentation of learning at the uh, end of last year in the spring where um, he had used his fascination with designing of video games. And he had created a video game that um, demonstrated his knowledge of um, the different content that he had explored throughout the year. Thank you. Um, so <clears throat> that would wrap up our presentation. We are uh, definitely uh, open for questions or comments uh, from the board, um, but just wanted to say that we're um, excited for the opportunity to continue to develop this uh, program and, and deliver this uh, approach to learning for students who value it so much. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Devon. If you could give us the screen back, that would be terrific. Okay, so board, we have four comments, four public comments on this item. I would like to plant a seed in the board's head for this. This was listed as a study, uh, study session. It was earmarked for a 30 minute study session. We're already well over that. My suggestion to the board would be that we bring this back as a discussion item on October 1. And then the board could give direction to staff with the items they would like to see flushed out, the areas that they feel are concerned, where we would like more, uh, more detail. I just, I'm afraid if we get into it now and treat this as a discussion item, We've already started early with, with closed session. We have more business to do. We have a timestamp item at seven. I'm just afraid where it's gonna go. I'd rather do it properly. If, uh, so let's have public comment now. And I just wanted to plant that seed and we'll deal with it when we come back. To <coughs> comment. So Lori, if you could do the comments. Please. Great, thank you. Um, each, we have four speakers on this item and each of you will have three minutes. Um, the first speaker is Seth Jacobson. Second speaker will be Joanne Berlin. Sarah, am I unmuted? You are. Okay, thanks. Uh, board, Dr. Drotty and staff, thank you very much. Um, Seth Jacobson, I'm, I'm speaking tonight as a parent of a PBL uh, student who uh, has, to use our moniker, thrived in this context and as also the only Malibu parent uh, for the first year. And uh, I just want to encourage, well, first of all, I want to thank the board for taking a really strong risk on this and doing what you did uh, to make this program happen and for continuing it in 20, 2021. Um, it's, it's an incredibly valuable experience. It's an amazing team. They're doing great work. Um, my child, uh, not to say that he wouldn't do well in the normal environment in Malibu High School, but having the ability to do these amazing things and create videos and study uh, video development and all kinds of things has been tremendous. And what Nicole and Jessica and the team there are doing is really great. My hope is that the board in their study session or in the discussion at the next meeting We'll see f fit to continue the program and put the full weight of the organization behind it. It's truly valuable. It's, it's tremendous for the kids, uh, for the kids who are in there. And uh, we're doing everything we possibly can to 
get kids and get people engaged. And unfortunately, the pandemic and other things, the word is not getting out there, but we are, we are making some headway. And uh, so with that, I just will be short because I know you're short on time and just say that um, big shout out to Dr. Drotty and the team for keeping it going. And uh, let's support it because this is what we want to do district wide. And uh, I believe that, that that shows a tremendous amount of leadership and vision. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Uh, Joanne Berlin and then Wendy Dembo and then followed by Lydia Moraro. And actually we have two more speakers, which I missed because I hadn't refreshed my, my Google Docs list. So there are actually six total. And Joanne is unmuted. Uh, hi, I'm Joanne Berlin. I'm uh, part of the steering committee of the Committee for Racial Justice, and we have uh, long been uh, interested in this project-based learning approach, and uh, I'm so glad to hear the uh, things that have happened during the first year and the way you've uh, got evaluations and are looking at how to improve it. For the second year, I'm still very puzzled as to why more students are not enrolling. I, I always thought that maybe um, the teachers would be playing a heavy role here in um, talking with some of the students in their classes that they know have potential that they're not using and they know the students are not engaged. And, and they're, they're the um, ones who can really try to help steer students and parents toward this program. I don't know whether that has been an emphasis for teachers, but I, but I think it should be. Um, I'm really um, pleased about this um, and, and hopeful that it will grow and that it will help to um, strengthen the, the concept of project-based learning throughout the district to all of the age levels and all of the grades. Um, I think these students can be great ambassadors for um, not only trying to recruit other students into this program, but also throughout the whole district for people to realize the importance of students being able to question, not always just sitting there receiving some information that they have to then regurgitate back to teachers, but actually uh, questioning, thinking on their own, working together to find answers and solutions. I, I think this is very powerful stuff. And um, I'm very um, hopeful that more and more parents and more and more students will come to be interested in this and, and get involved. I have a, a very close friend in Connecticut where I moved here from, who was a uh, now retired English teacher, was head of uh, English departments uh, for districts and so forth. And I did send her the um, PowerPoint from the special meeting that you all had on uh, thinking about being an, uh, becoming an anti-racist district. And she just said that all of all of this, this kind of approach and this kind of uh, project-based learning thing weaving into it is what colleges are, are looking for. People are worried that this is not college preparation. She said they, they want districts, they want students coming out of districts that have been innovating, that are working on prioritizing equity and diversity and um, things that you have been willing to focus on this year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Wendy Dembo, Lydia Moraro, and then Angela D. Scott and Erica Leslie. And that'll wrap our public speakers up for this item. Um, thank you, board, and Dr. Drotty, Dr. Mora. Um, I went to a lot of the meetings regarding the project-based learning high school when it started, and it seems that um, the purpose has changed. And initially, you said that it wasn't going to happen if there were less than 100 students. Now, the second year, there's still less than 
a hundred students. And I don't know how many students you started with, but you ended up with 41 students last year. So I'm wondering if the ninth grade class, which is 45 students, is gonna go down to less students. Um, I really am a proponent of project-based learning. I myself went to the alternative school on the Venice boardwalk in the 70s. Um, I just feel that it's so fantastic. I just don't understand why it can't be spread throughout the entire district. Um, it just seems that it's a lot of money for very few students. Um, my daughter is at Lincoln and eighth graders at Lincoln are not even able to take art because there's not the budget for um, an art teacher for all of the eighth graders who would like to take art. So it just seems to me that the district could spend the money more wisely in um, schools which are already open and um, have students who have needs and they could be better served to more than 74 students. Um, I, I, the concept of agency over learning, I find amazing and exceptional. I, I don't want my daughter to just regurgitate information like Joanne Berlin said. Um, so it's something to really think about, like in this time when the budget, we have such a small budget and there are all these budget problems and teachers were laid off, is it the right time to be spending so much money on so few children when there are other children in the school district who are not getting even things that are as basic as art. Um, so I would say that. And also I feel like social justice should be taught at all schools. And that should be something that all students are working with and studying and not, you know, instead of having a one day seminar or an hour, mm -hmm. all the other students should have, you know, a, a long time to really discuss and delve into this as opposed to just, you know, 40 minutes for you know one time or a special assembly. So I would really say that because I, I feel that most children really benefit from project-based learning, COVID is giving us an opportunity to be really innovative with the way school is and how people learn and are experiencing school. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like this is an opportunity for all of the Santa Monica school students to be given more agency over their learning just because it's up. not a great idea for them to just be staring at the computer screen all day. So thank you so much and have a good evening. Thank you. Lydia Moraro. Good evening. Thank you. I'm frustrated that the speaker doesn't have their camera on because I feel like seeing you seeing me is part of understanding how I feel. But anyway, I'll proceed without. Um, so in echoing what uh, Wendy Dembo just said, um, and having um, so few children benefiting from such a fantastic program, I would like to know what the district plans are to uh, continue or stop this endeavor uh, financially now that we've had a great study of how it's been the first year, we're looking at it's going to be the second year, it's still under, underpopulated and overfunded still, in my opinion, um, in the opinion of many. So I'd like to know, is the district just going to continue with this indefinitely? We've had a plan saying, okay, well, we're giving it three years, we're giving it four years. How many years are you giving it for it to succeed? And I'd like to know that. Also, I'm a little confused about the Malibu parent comment. Uh, I wasn't aware that there is a Malibu site at which this school, this PBL is being taught in particular. And I'd like the board, everybody to clarify here, are we teaching PBL somewhere else than at the Obama Center? And if so, how many children are attending in Malibu? who are the teachers teaching them, how many are there per class, it's all the data that you gave for, you know, the, the ensemble of the children. If some are attending in Malibu, I'd like to know what that is and what it looks like, and like to know why it's not um, spoken of in this presentation. 
That's it for PBL. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lydia. Um, the next two speakers, remaining speakers, are Angela D. Scott and Erica Leslie. Hi, uh, good evening, Dr. Drotti, school board members. Um, I have to start by saying my heart is truly full. As we just took a deep dive into the curriculum for this year, I'm excited about PPBL. Um, I agree with, while I do agree with Joanne regarding looking at different ways for recruitment, I, I believe that by working together with current parents, you guys can collaborate and look at innovative ways of going out to the PTAs and and you know um, having especially now with the Zoom calls and and talking to different um, you know through family engagement. Look at that way as far as your uh, ways, or look at Crest, look at Boys and Girls Club, look at those ways you know for recruiting. But anyways, um, moving on. Um, as far as Nicole, Jessica, and Devon, I applaud you and the work you're doing at PPBL, connecting students to the real world, the student voice, and student choice. Those are pivotal approaches. Engaging learners in a fundamental goal. But also, it is challenging, but the way that you guys are doing, the innovation that you're bringing to the table, you know, through, um, through even looking through a, um, as we look through the pandemic and taking that, um, that look of social justice and looking at public health and your approach to that, that again, engages students. It has them take a look at real world issues and how to solve them. So the whole methodology, give students the ability to approach learning through different styles, which is the whole focus of PPBL, which again, I applaud. Um, even looking at how the student looked, uh, created video games as a form of looking at eugenics. Again, that's awesome. And just to be clear with um, Wendy, who uh, was concerned about social justice, it's actually being rolled out in all of the schools this year. And I'm sure the board can speak on that further, but it is being rolled out at every single school. So. Um, but that's not here for me to comment on. And then, I'm sorry, and then one more thing. Again, when we look at the Pedro Noguera report and the different suggestions and the ways that he mentioned about engaging our students, a lot of the students can connect to this, which again, is the ultimate thing, connecting students. This is student driven. Not many schools have that. And so this is a precious treasure, which I believe one day will be a true model for other schools across the nation. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, and our last speaker again is Erica Leslie. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can. Okay. I'm just trying to make sure because you know, internet <laughs> is really spotty sometimes. Oh, it's crazy. <laughs> so what I, I, I truly support PBL, I came through Santa Monica College. I, I went through public policy and I am a result of project-based learning. This is where you can really get a child engaged. If I, as an adult, can get excited about learning something that are within my interest range, imagine what a child can do. You, this is, PBL is what we need right now. We're in the midst of this pandemic and all the old archaic ways are going about to fall away. We have to do something new and innovative, otherwise we're not going to survive. All the things that we used to know, by the time we're finished with this pandemic, might just fall away and it won't be the same when we come back. We have to start thinking of innovation. PBL was ahead of the rolling block, ahead of everything else that e before they could even foresee this pandemic. PBL was created and this is what we need so that we can move forward. Because everybody that has worked in physicality, as far as being out and in front of this whole pandemic, we can't do those jobs anymore. They have to do something else that's new and something else that's innovative that they can do in the safety of their homes or even code or develop. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes our public comments for this item. Okay, so I'm going to repeat what I said before. I, I think the best course of action for the board right now, this is a real discussion that we need to have. There are a lot of questions. There's a lot of material that's been brought up today. I would like to give us time to do it properly. So my suggestion would be that we come back on October 1st with a discussion item, a PPPL discussion item. In the meantime, the board should direct all clarifying questions and direction 
to Dr. Gerardi so he can communicate with Drs. Mora and Smith and, and get the materials that we need. Um, I just fear if we open this up now, we're gonna be here talking for the next hour and a half and we haven't prepared properly for it. I am not trying to skirt this discussion. I'm just trying to do it properly. So, um, it, yeah, Ralph. Uh, um, I just wanted to make it, yeah, I'm fine with that. I just want to make a comment to the person who questioned about whether there's another program. And if we're going to wait a couple of weeks, we should clear that up. That no, there's one program. There happens to be one or more Malibu um, families who are sending their, um, their children to the PPBL in Santa Monica. Yeah, thank you for doing that, Ralph. I appreciate it. And, and, to, and even though Angela Scott corrected this, uh, we do have K-12 social justice standards. They actually exist pre-K-12, our social justice standards. So we are, that is something that we're seeing at every grade level at our school. So, so then with the board's permission, I've, I've seen enough hands go up. We will, so Sarah hears this, a December 1st, a discussion item on PPBL. Board members, please October. get your October. Did you say October 1st? October 1st, what did I say? I think you said December. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Uh, another reason why uh, uh, yeah. deeper discussions are right now. Um, so uh, we can communicate this to the community. We have a better discussion about it. So that being said, we have time before our timestamp to do communications. Now we have new student John, members. John, will you just thank all of the staff on our behalf, please? Oh my no. gosh. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you all for coming into it. Too. And there was a lot of information that came out. And because it was so much and there's so much to bring back, I think it's best to respect your time by doing it October 1st. Yeah, they're rock stars. Thank you. Yes. Oh, Dr. Moore, did you want to chime in? Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you to our team, right? Thank you, Dr. Smith, Ms. Jessica Rich, Nicole, Nicodemus, for all your hard work. Uh, you are so greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for all of your efforts, recruiting and revamping the program to meet the needs of students. Thank you. Okay, so thanks, Dr. Moore. So we do have new student board members um, from two of our three high schools. From Malibu High School, we have Estelle Shaw. And from Olympic High School, we have Emily Jackson. I know Ms. Jackson is not available tonight. I don't know if Ms. Shaw joined us from Malibu High. Anyone? I'm looking for her in the list. I don't see her. I don't. Nisha, if you are here, please identify yourself, but I don't think you made it. Hopefully we'll meet our new board members on the 17th at our next meeting or on October 1st. Um, which brings us to our union report from uh, SMMCTA, Ms. Braff. You are muted. You're muted. <laughs> you know how that goes. The strangest school year of our careers has begun and teachers have worked hard to prepare for it. But after only two weeks, it is clear distance learning is taking a mental and physical toll on both students and staff. Most teachers find themselves planning and preparing for the next lessons every evening and all weekend without ever getting a break, getting ahead or finding time to grade. Remote teaching is harder than we ever expected, and we don't see a break for the foreseeable future. Yet it appears many in our community believe schools should be normal in terms of hours of learning, that remote classrooms should mimic regular school. Distance learning during a pandemic is not normal, and school cannot be either. It is not realistic or healthy for students or staff. Preparation time needed for asynchronous learning requires more than twice the planning as synchronous learning, and the time we have been given is inadequate to the task. Educators are asked to create a daily television show while expected to simultaneously learn all the technology, including multiple virtual platforms, video editing, online support for themselves and their families. Craft and generate educational content, prepare plans, design curriculum, create lessons, and engage their audience, making sure their students log in, understand the lesson, and support. Students may not have the book eyes for paper-based learning. We are asking 
is it unreasonable to ask a kindergarten student to be on Zoom for a or it is synchronic? Do all secondary the whole minutes, or can they come on and off as they work on their project? And this project is learning. PE part of learning. Sarah, I'm gonna Sarah, I'm gonna career off because we can Sarah, your connection has gone mental and physically required for learning. We know the first few days of school are hard under the best of circumstances. Now with the present schedule of synchronous teaching, they have been almost impossible. Okay, I'm gonna cut off my picture then so that ho hopefully that will help the um, the sound. My, so I'm going to repeat the last paragraph. We are asking if it's unreasonable to ask a kindergarten student to be on Zoom 120 minutes, whether or not it is synchronous. Do all secondary students really need to be able to, to be live the entire 80 minutes, or can they come on and off as they work on their projects, such as project-based learning? Shouldn't we have PE as an integral part of their learning and minutes? And how may we take into consideration the accommodation of students' developmental and physical needs required for learning? We know the first few days of school are hard under the best of circumstances. Now with the present schedule of synchronous teaching, they have become almost impossible. Never before have I heard from so many teachers who are barely hanging on and it's only the end of the second week. We recognize the district is in a difficult spot and we applaud them for responding to our request to hold off on new professional development time for three weeks. Thank you. But we know we will need to continue. We will continue to need more planning time each week. That necessity is not going away. We ask the board and the district to work with us to provide a more feasible schedule for a virtual classroom interaction. One that reduces the amount of student screen time and to give our teachers more planning time. Thank so you. sorry, so sorry, I don't listen it's in not, Spanish. It's not translating, the, the translation is not coming through. That's well, that's a shame. Hold Chair on one second. Hold on. Did most people hear what I had to say? In English, yes. I'm just looking in the translation room. Hold on one second. Okay, thank you. Once you turn your video off, the volume, the voice part started to work again. Where did my translators go? Well, that's interesting. I think everyone's internet is better right now. Hold on. It says they're still on. Let's try again. No, cuando hubo el el switch de la conexión que no se le entendía se descubrió. Yes. And, and you, you, you tried clicking on the, um, on the Spanish translation again? Oh, she might have had it. Okay, it's on. Sorry about that. Okay, ahora sí, gracias. Thank you everyone for fixing that. Um, and thank you, Sarah Brown, for your report. Am I muted? No, I'm not muted. Um, we'll move to uh, Chris Mock with SEIU. Chris, I saw you earlier. Yeah, I see him down there. Okay. Chris is unmuted, but I don't hear anything. Hear me? Yeah, we got you now, Chris. Okay, so you can hear me? Sorry, it's a little bit janky here. I, uh, you can't see me though, I guess my video's turned up. Okay, that's, okay, sorry. Uh, good evening board members, Superintendent Gerardi, Executive Council, staff in the community. This pandemic has laid bare the inequities in education and the need for increased and permanent funding to ensure all students have access to quality education. This crisis has also put a spotlight on the important and essential work of classified school employees and our contributions to student learning and the well being of our communities. As we start a new school year and head into the election this fall, these issues are driving much of the work of, this, of SEIU Local 99 members. 
We are addressing the need for increased revenue for public education with outreach and education to voters about Prop 15, the schools, about Prop 15, the Schools and Communities First Funding Act. The passage of this proposition will reclaim $12 billion annually by requiring corporations and businesses to pay their fair share of property taxes. This reclaimed tax will go directly to our local school districts, hospitals, direct responders, and other public services we need now more than ever. I want to thank this board for endorsing Prop 15 and for doing your part in getting the word out and educating our community on how the passing of Prop 15 will help our state and our school district recover, ensure a safe return to schools, and expand services to our most vulnerable students. At a more local level, SEIU and the district continue in discussions on an agreement for distance learning and to fully restore child development services for our communities. We are scheduled to meet again tomorrow afternoon to discuss these issues. It is our goal that our agreement includes a more specific plan beyond just good intentions to ensure the safety of all workers and restore CDS services and rescind layoffs of CDS classroom assistants. Lastly, a word about inclusion and, in and inequity. During the special board of education meeting, we spoke about all the programs and plans the district has in place for the future to address racism in our schools and our institutions. We commend the educators, parents, and administrators for all this good work. They are good first steps, but we also need to begin to look at pr practices in this district that promote inequity and injustice. In all the work to address inclusion and equity, where was the voice of food service workers, paraeducators, instructional assistants, and other classified employees? For instance, how can we speak about family engagement without recognizing the efforts of our bilingual community liaisons, who like many of our classified staff, not only go above and beyond what's required of them, but hold an invaluable wealth of information inside the connections they have fostered with these families they serve. Their voice and contributions have seemingly been left out of the conversation. Where were we in any of the committees, groups, or processes? This is inequity. Where is the inclusion when hundreds of frontline workers were left out? The fact is that for years, classified staff have worked inside of a system in which they are regarded as less than. Their contributions to student learning have gone unrecognized and underappreciated. In fact, as we see with the recent CDS layoffs, their jobs are considered expendable. It cannot be lost that the majority of classified school employees are people of color. They are the lowest paid workers in this school district, and most do not qualify for health or welfare benefits because they are regulated. They are relegated, sorry, to part to part-time status. Yet they are our essential workers who have reported to work sites during this global pandemic. They have been on the front lines feeding our children, keeping our schools clean, and making sure students have the technology they need. They have put themselves in harm's way to help our students and families in this time of great need. If we are to truly become an inclusive, equitable, and anti-racist school district, there needs to be a recognition and a resolution to the inequity suffered by dedicated education workers in this very district. We must all begin to have the hard, courageous conversations to truly become an inclusive and equitable community. We thank you in advance for the opportunity to be at the table and share in these important conversations moving forward. I thank you for your time and have a good evening. Thank you so much for your report, Chris. And our final communication report will be PTA Council, Gabrielle Cohen. Thank you. Uh, hello, President Keene and board members and everyone else joining us tonight. As we are just finishing the second week of school, starting to settle in a bit, I wanted to first and foremost say the general consensus that I'm hearing from parents and students um, and that I've experienced with my own students is that things are actually going really well. We want to thank the district and administration for all of the hard work in making this happen during such uncertain times. As a representative of the PTA, we mostly want to give a big thank you to the teachers for taking the time to learn new skills and polish some old ones in order to be able to teach our children during distance learning. Most of the time, we only hear from the people who are really dissatisfied with how things are going, and I felt it was really important to also hear about the good. Some of the comments that I have heard recently are, my student is really engaged. We love all of the synchronous time. The teachers are doing a great job breaking up the time by giving breaks to stretch, 
using breakout rooms and doing small group work. The teachers are there to answer questions while the students are working and after, and those are just a few. We always believe that our district is strongest when we all come together and hope we can continue to do so. Our PTAs are also working hard to reinvent how they function. They are coming up with new ways to offer parent education, to get members on board, and to give our students the extras we want them to have. We hope that everyone, including our community members, will support our PTAs by becoming members. The more members we have, the more we can advocate for the students and the families. Thank you for the time. Thank you so much, Gabrielle. And from the board, happy belated birthday. Uh, normally we would go to our superintendents. We have a timestamp item at seven. I think we should go to the timestamp item now. So let's do that. I apologize if anybody is waiting for Ben's report. Can I suggest we did Ben's report first? I mean, there's nothing about the timestamp item that can't wait five minutes. That's true. And I guess the times and Ben's report will have a lot of cook. You're right. That's, that's a better suggestion. Okay. Oh, I didn't mean to be. <laughs> the true power behind the board right here. So let's go to the <laughs> superintendent's report. <laughs> you, can give the, you know, Lori's right. I mean, because Ben's going to be reporting on COVID updates. It's more important to get this out. And the timestamp will be up by 7.15. Well, Take it away, Ben. What the president meant to say was. <laughs> Absolutely. So thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Keene. And thank you all the presenters that just presented. Um, I, I'm gonna give, uh, an, I'm gonna make it a habit uh, each, uh, each board meeting to give a COVID update because I think that, that's important to always keep um, the community um, abreast of what's happening. And this thing is an evolving thing throughout, uh, throughout the year. Each week there's something new. So uh, with that said, uh, we are finalizing the second week of distance learning and and I think uh, you heard from Gabriel Cohen, uh, PTA president, that, uh, that, 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 that uh, anecdotally things are going pretty well, uh, just based on what I'm hearing from parents and, and from different people and from students that I've been uh, able to uh, consult with. Um, uh, they, there is a definite difference between what people are experiencing now uh, versus what was happening in the springtime. So a great job. I want to thank all the uh, certificated staff, teachers, uh, classified, and management um, uh, for the efforts of putting these, um, uh, working in these difficult circumstances all summer and in preparation for, uh, to deliver uh, the curriculum. Um, we are also learning this, uh, you heard from Sarah Braff, there is a level of fatigue uh, from some staff that we are hearing. Um, and and, um, uh, and pr primarily from the, the elementary level uh, or primary level uh, students. Uh, so that is something that uh, we're, uh, as I mentioned before, we need to continue to be in conversation, but we're, I am pulling together uh, principals tomorrow uh, to have a conversation about what they're seeing uh, out there, uh, what they're experiencing, um, and then what, they're, what their teachers are experiencing. And then uh, from there, we hope to gather information and, and make some adjustments. Um, we had we have planned for our weekly uh, professional learning series to start next week. We're going to hold back off of that uh, for a couple of weeks, a uh, few weeks, uh, for the staff to continue to come together and uh, meet and have conversations, and then and then and then, and then get into this rhythm of really planning uh, uh, planning lessons. What I would encourage uh, all staff out there that's listening to this, and I'll, I'll make sure I put this also in writing. Um, in the meantime, you, the best, um, the, the teachers that uh, from that spring also, from what I'm hearing now, the ones that work together uh, as teams, whether it be you're in grade level teams or subject specific teams in, in the secondary, uh, you can share the load in establishing some of these asynchronous courses or, or, or working together to develop uh, the curriculum. Because the, the approach to teaching is different. I mean, you have to come up with uh, 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 different approaches. So when you have uh, groups of people working together, it's just much easier. Uh, I experienced that in my job in a daily basis that if I was to sit here and try to think through all these problems by myself, uh, it, it, it wouldn't work. Uh, I, would be, I would be overwhelmed. But the fact that I sit around with a bunch of people uh, in a regular basis just to kind of iron things out, run things by, uh, is, is very helpful. So that could also help with the uh, teaching also. 
we are going to formally uh, send out surveys in probably in a week or so uh, to all the parents, uh, the staff, uh, certificated and classified, and to secondary students to kind of hear about their experience uh, where, uh, in order to identify where areas that we can improve on and areas of growth uh, to, so that way we can make some uh, necessary adjustments we need to make. So, so um, for those teachers that are struggling right now, uh, uh, right now, just note that uh, please, please continue to work in teams, work with your, with your principals. We are going to pull back on, on some of the trainings for you to have more time uh, in, in, in collaborating and, 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 and developing those curriculum, uh, the curriculum that's, uh, that's needed. So, um, so I'll leave that for now in terms of um, uh, 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 distance learning. Um, I don't know if everybody really understands this, but it, while we are engaging in distance learning, the goal was always to be able to, uh, uh, to establish a plan to come back in person. So we've been, uh, while we opened up for uh, distance learning, we were, we've been simultaneously working to establish protocols so that in the case when we are ready to come back, uh, that, that we are ready. The state just uh, uh, basically solidified some, uh, some protocols that we need to meet. Uh, so we are in the process of working through those protocols um, in terms of uh, personal protective equipment and how we move students around uh, and, and how we situate classrooms. All those things are gonna be aligned to some of the ideas that we have already about establishing some kind of a hybrid process. And so we are in the process of developing those things. And um, uh, so that is coming uh, uh, to board members. We expect to bring you something to look at uh, by the end of the month or early, early October. Um, uh, right now, no one can open in the, in the LA County uh, for, for a live instruction. Uh, but the minute, the time that uh, when we are off the watch list and the state, the county says that we can go back, then we'll have to really uh, be ready to be able to do that. Uh, a lot of this involves making sure that the staff feels comfortable and, they're, and they're, they're, there's an agreement with, the, with CTA and SEIU uh, that they, they accept uh, what we have in terms of protocols and that we're able to come back. So we're, we're going to be working simultaneously uh, with them and looking at the protocols and having them weigh in on these things uh, until we have a, we have a plan um, uh, ready in, in case that we're ready to come back. So there'll be a decision point sometime this spring. Uh, uh, this this fall, uh, when we'll decide when we come back, uh, you you will notice that I have not we have not stated a date yet. Uh, we just said uh, we we're starting with distance learning, and that we plan to work on coming back in in person, but we have not established a date, and that's going to come uh, as we uh, evolve with this process. So new changes between um, last week and now. The state has actually, um, the state and LA County, uh, the health department, uh, health department have actually authorized for uh, and put in protocols and guidance for uh, for students uh, the uh, most need uh, to be able to bring back uh, for, for us to be able to bring them back uh, uh, and, and for live instruction. Uh, we're per primarily talking about special education students as well as um, the English learner students. Um, the, the order just came recently. Uh, we're still in the process of looking at the details, of what we need to put in place for that to occur. And we're engaging the, both units, uh, the SEIU and CTA, about what, the, what they will want to see in place uh, for them to feel comfortable in serving these students. Uh, but uh, you'll probably hear in the news somewhere that September 14th is the date where you can bring uh, some students back, uh, the special education and EL students back uh, within the protocols uh, and guidance by September 14th. Uh, I don't know too many school districts are going to be ready by next week, but I just want the community to know that we, we are cognizant of what's, what's happening out there and we're working towards a place where in which we can bring students back safely and staff back safely. We'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll do that. And then La uh, and then that also that also uh, ties to the whole idea that um, before we open there there will be an opportunity for county districts to uh, apply for a waiver to come back before the entire district is able to come back uh, and and the state has given guidance for that to occur 
so but but all of that uh, whether we bring back special education students el students or apply for a waiver uh, to come back or before everybody comes back is um uh, is still predicated on all those protocols that we we uh, we're working on. So, so, so once those protocols are flushed out, uh, uh, it'll just be much um, uh, much easier to execute some of these uh, some of these new um, plans for bringing students back. And then, lastly, um, uh, we are, as I mentioned before, we are very interested in supporting families uh, that do not have supervision at home. Uh, the state, uh, as of last week, also authorized a way to bring students back uh, through our uh, through different mechanisms. One of those is through the CDS uh, child care program, and they have actually authorized for us to extend those programs through this through the school year. And if you recall, the CDS programs are often before school and after school services, but the state has now said that you can do you can ex ex extend those those child care programs through the school day. So our interest is in, in bringing back these learning hubs um, uh, for students to come, uh, um, uh, uh, learn through, uh, execute their distance learning and learn through distance learning in a hub that we, we would identify here in the district. And um, so uh, we, we you have to apply for that to occur. And uh, Dr. Susan Smart Powell has, is in the process of sending in the applications. And once that's approved, I'll be coming to you about what that means in terms of staffing, and if I'm going to actually ask for for us to um, uh, uh, probably put a little money into bring, being able to open up some uh, supervision um, or, or, or learning hubs. Obviously, we would do this within uh, the constraints of our budget uh, uh, that we can afford. But but our interest is to is to open that up. We'll probably initially start with our staff, uh, our children. And then, and then, because that, that, that's that, that's probably the biggest need at this point right now. Not not to say that the parents don't need it, uh, but right now we do have staff. A part of the stress that you probably see from staff is that some of them are at home with their own children, and they're trying to teach while while helping their own children at home. I mean, I, as you can see, that can be very very difficult. So if we can alleviate that. It helps everyone, the the, the, the staff as well as the students that are being taught by the by the staff. So I think I'll stop here um, and, and then more information will come on that piece. Um, like I said, we're in the uh, process of applying and then and I'll be coming to you about what the structure looks like and how much, uh, how much it may cost. And then get, so, so, so that way uh, I'll ask for approval uh, for you to approve the cost and, and, and we'll move forward on that uh, if, you, if you all agree. With that said, that concludes the superintendent's report and, and that's it, uh, Mr. King. Hey. Thanks so much, Dr. Jotty. Um, and it's good for people to know that every two weeks during the superintendent's report, they will be getting uh, a, a COVID update from you. Uh, it's not quite yeah. Cuomo doing his daily thing from New York that we yeah. had in May, but it's good yeah. to know that we can check in and get that information. Hopefully, um, Gail Pinsker yeah. can take these reports yeah. and then blast them out so people have exactly what I was going to suggest. That Absolutely. would be wonderful. Absolutely. Let's coordinate with Gail. Yeah. Absolutely. Our, and our goal is to uh, create a rhythm in a weekly basis that these will be turned into yeah. a document. Where, and we're actually experimenting with some video things that we'll see if that works or not. But, uh, but just in a weekly basis, there'll be something coming out. It, whatever we can be doing to communicate better and, and with all different styles, I think is effective. So thank yeah. you for that um, moving forward. Uh, we are going to move to our timestamp item, which is major action J1, uh, 1920 unaudited actual financial report. Melody Kennedy. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, good evening, John Keene, our board president, um, uh, Dr. Drotty, the board members, and our my fellow um, cabinet members and community. Um, I am going to start sharing my screen really quick with all of you and get this pre presentation going. Kind of squish you guys out of the way a little bit. Can everybody see this? Can we get a raise of a hand or something? Or something, or something? Everybody seeing it? Okay. Yes. All right. So I'm not hearing anybody say they can't see it. So here we go. Um, actually, I would, before I do get started here, I would like to say thank you to um, uh, Mr. Ger Gerardo Cruz and his team in the financial um, department. They did a stellar job of trying to get all this together. 
um, as we're all talking about COVID and all the things that we're doing, these folks are just like everybody else. They're actually working from home and they're, they're kind of, they're, they're floating in and out of the office as much as they can, um, trying to, to keep the social distancing, what have you. Um, all of us have been just kind of, um, I don't want to say crippled, but um, doing business in a different way than we've ever done it before. So for them to be able to put this together and to um, get our books closed in at the, probably the, the most record time I think I've seen it ever done in, in my career, quite honestly, I'm very proud of those folks for, for, for doing that. And I want to say thank you so much for, to all of them. Um, and Mr. Cruz, I believe, is here with us. He is actually supposedly on vacation, but that's kind of how you roll whenever you sit in, you sit in his spot. So um, he's going to be able to um, jump in at any time. And I think there will be one point where I'll ask him to come in. But with that, um, let's see, I can't get, this will work, there we go. So what are unaudited actuals? Um, it, it, the unaudited actuals are actually where the district prepares a year-end financial statement as of June 30th using the state format known as SACS or the state account code structure for all district funds. Um, it's a report of activities in all district funds identifying reserves that are carried forward into future years or unspent funds. Um, you can see uh, that information in attachment one and, and attachment number two. It's used by external auditors to prepare the official audit report. And in June, um, our staff presents, or the staff presents the 2019-20 estimated actuals with the um, budget adoption for 2021. And then we come back here and have um, conversation now about, well, did we hit those, did we hit those estimates or where are we at? Um, and we'll, we'll talk tonight, or we'll talk now about what, what are the changes since June, um, whenever we did those estimated actuals. Um, year in closing entries are prepared and posted. The financial books uh, of the, districts ha the district has been closed and unspent allocations have been identified and reserved or assigned to the fund balance as, an, as appropriate. Um, once again, you can see those in attachments three and four in the, in the packet. And then unaudited actuals are compared to estimated actuals as presented with the 2020-21 the adopted budget. Um, why are projections different than expected? Well, in general, in general terms, some districts use conservatively um, estimated revenues and allocated expenditures during the budget and interim reporting process, which we do use um, a slightly um, conservative estimate ourselves. The risk of miscalculating or underestimating is, is really too great and um, running out of cash will never ever be a good thing for us or anyone. And then um, one of the biggest reasons that you're gonna see changes tonight is probably basically COVID-19. Um, so some common reasons for the differences is um, we had additional or less revenues um, were, as we had received that, that we, that we received that we had not expected. And we had expenditure allocations or budgets um, were not completely used. Um, we had rollover purchase orders um, that were carried into the, into the new year. So for, for um, this, this is kind of everything that they did, closing the books. This is like, you know, the big highlights, the big snapshot and what have you, this one particular um, um, PowerPoint slide. Um, with it, the, the books were closed, and in closing them, we closed with um, $7,537,933 more than we had expected, whereas revenues were $1,488,977 more than expected. Um, we had less, um, we had less S LCFF funds, um, which was from the RDA and the property taxes of $938,000. $39,889. We had a higher in lieu property tax transfer to charter schools of $266,977, excuse me, $997. We had a higher education protection account or the EPA account um, at $506,694. We had a higher reimbursement for Medicare administrative uh, um, activities, which is called MAW of $57,609. $57, $57, $57, $57, $57, $57, $57, $57, $57, $57, 
We had um, higher measure uh, GSH and Y of $2,095,622. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that when we get over to the um, actual spreadsheet on this as well. Um, measure R came in higher as well at $322,039. And then we had a higher interest earn of $290,221 than expected. Um, we did have a lower um, local Fund, uh, local general fund contribution to the routine um, routine restricted uh, maintenance account of one million forty four thousand eight hundred eighty seven dollars, but we did ha have a higher um, local general con fund contribution to special ed at five hundred eighty nine thousand eight hundred and ninety one dollars, and then we had unspent LCAP um, supplemental grant at nine hundred twenty two thousand four hundred and fifteen dollars. We had unspent stretch grant and formula at $174,978. We had unspent supplies and textbooks at $1,615,214. Um, then there was unspent county specialized um, um, schools transfers of $58,552. Excuse me, I think I said million, I meant $58,552. Um, we had unspent certificated salary um, due to unfilled positions and lower um, hourly and sub cost at $698,159. And then we had unspent and other operating costs, which would include your legal, travel, consultants, um, uh, things of that nature of $2,519,274. So with all of that, that's what makes up that $7,537,933. Um, we also um, brought in a property tax comparison into this slide so that you can kind of see, and I highlighted over here on the uh, right-hand side, all of the different, um, are all the variances from fiscal year to fiscal year, fiscal year um, throughout each year. Um, we're projecting at a 5% right now for 2021, but we did have a 6.69% increase in um, property tax in uh, 1920 in the year that we're talking about. And that was a jump from the, the 2.6 um, in 2.67% from um, 1819. I won't spend too much time on that. Um, this one is actually a historical difference of where we've ended each year. Um, it was kind of brought to my attention that this says deficit spending, and you notice that it, everything that's in red so it means it is a deficit and everything, anything that's in black is not deficit. So I think what we're going to do is probably change this a little bit and just say a difference in, in, um, in <laughs> a difference in revenues over, uh, over um, um, expenditures or something to that effect. But we'll, we'll just kind of change the titles. But as you can see, the 1920 year, uh, we ended with a deficit of $222,497. And we'll, we'll go through a um, spreadsheet here in a moment that um, you can see all these numbers put together as well. So observations to, to keep in mind. Um, we do have a moderate declining enrollment. Um, property taxes are an extremely high percentage of our LCFF funding. Um, also, community re redevelopment funds are, are a significant percentage of that LCFF funding as well. Um, we have um, a great deal of parcel tax, um, special sales tax measures, and donations are a significant percentage of our total revenue, which makes us a little bit, you know, um, um, vulnerable sometimes if, as, as to what our revenues are going to look like or what they're not going to look like. Um, given the potential for revenue volatility, expenditures need to be managed strategically, and we need to continue to monitor our COVID-19 expenditures at this time. So I'm going to go ahead, and I think I actually have to stop sharing really quick with you folks. So stop sharing because I need to share something else. And let's share. Um, and I know she has it open, but I can't seem to find it. Isn't that always fun? We'll just bring it up here. Okay. Here we go. Um, hopefully everybody can see this. I'm not moving on without you. So this is really kind of the format that we, we do for multi-year projections. 
and with, with multi-year projections. Um, this one, however, if you'll notice, what we've done is all, all the same um, line items that we have in our multi-year projections. However, we don't have multiple years. What we did, because we are talking about 2019-20, what we did, we put in the-, the Melody, we can't see the um, NYP. What was that? We can't see the NYP. Oh, you can't see it? No. Oh. Okay, well, I was so excited and just moving on without you. You can only see your, your actual folder in your file system. Okay, yeah, you have to so open it up. Stop it and see if I can do it again. I've changed computers, so I apologize, folks. I had broken my other one and they gave me the new one. And now I am going to share with you, I think. Can you see it now? Uh, yes. yes. Good, okay. All right, let's try this again. So this uh, format is, like I said, is the same as your multi-year projections. And um, with your multi-year projections, we normally have you know multiple years within here. However, being that we are talking about 2019-20, what we have done is um, just put all of the times that we've been together and that we've actually reported uh, out our um, budgets. So we have the adopted, the first interim, the second interim, and the third revision. And then we have the estimated actuals, which would have been reported with the adopted budget. And then we have the unaudited actuals of where we actually close the books. We're gonna concentrate right here in column F, G, and H. And um, there is a column I. I'm not really going to speak to it this time, but when I get done here, I'm gonna ask um, Mr. Cruz um, to come forward and kind of talk about that section a little bit. We don't normally put it in here, but because we just did a 45 day revision, um, we went ahead and added that in, but there are a couple of nuances here and, and we'll, I'll have him discuss that when we're done. Um, I'm not gonna go line for line, for line on this because it, it's kind of obvious what's here. And plus what I just said to you in, in um, a couple of um, slides back where I gave you all those numbers and all of that information, it's all in here as well. So I don't wanna um, keep beating, beating the horse at this point in time. But as you can see on line seven, our subtotal for LCFF funding came in at, seven, at $700,192 less than what we had anticipated. And a portion of that we talked about a while ago, and that's at $939,889 um, difference with our um, RDA um, funds with that, within our property taxes. And so that kind of created that, but you did have that educational and um, that education protection act account at 506,694 to kind of offset that. And like I said, given us that 792,000. So as we look down and continue to go down, I'm gonna look at um, line 27 where it says total revenues. As you go across, you can see that we were looking at 117,000, 117,000,000.6 million point six um, for um, rev total revenues at, whenever we were doing the estimated, we came in, came in at 119.1 uh, million instead, giving us a difference, a, 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 a um, plus actually, of $1,488,977. Then we get into um, total, get into your um, revenues, and with revenues, um, um, everything that I had mentioned before when we were talking about certificated salaries and the benefits and what have you, I've highlighted all of those within um, this particular column to show you what those actual differences were as, as we came in. But I'm not going to um, say them line by line um, as we've already discussed them. But what I want to do is take you down here to line 74 where it's total expenditures and our total expenditures decreased by $6,048,955. And we'll talk about what we think, you know, caused all of, ca what caused a lot of that um, as we open this up for um, discussion. So, um, like I said, we ended the um, 1920 fiscal year with um, a deficit of $222,497. And with that, I think what I'm gonna do is ask um, Gerardo to actually talk about um, column F or the 45 day revision. 
Sure, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so if we're looking at the very last column in the 45 day revision and you just scroll down to the components of the ending fund balances. One of the questions that was brought up, which is a very good question, means they're following the numbers exactly how they're supposed to, everyone is. Uh, we look at line um, 77, uh, excuse, me, excuse me, line 76. Um, we see that number says a 14 million number. Um, that number we can see was based off of, if you go one, two, three columns over to the left, you see it in line 76, that same $14 million number, 14.6. When we adopted the 45-day uh, revision, uh, we had not presented to you yet these these unaudited actuals. So when you did the 45-day uh, revision, you were doing that based off the estimated actuals that we presented back in June. So in order to keep the integrity of what the board adopted for the 45-day revision, we left that those dollar amounts in the very last column so that we were not presenting anything that the board had not already seen and had already adopted. The question became, well, uh, if you go one column to the right, we see a $22.2 million number still on that line 77. The question became, well, why isn't that our new um, ending, our beginning fund balance for the next year? And that number you will see when we go and do your first interim report in December. But the most important key takeaway is that we wanted to keep the integrity of what you already adopted for the 45-day revision um, last month, excuse me. Uh, we didn't want to present something that hadn't um, yet been approved. And so that's why those numbers look different. Um, like Melody said, we don't usually present these uh, this new year, uh, but since it's a COVID year and everything's on the table and uh, we wanted to make sure that we were giving a preview into what the new year looked like. But yes, that $14.6 million number for the very last column on line 76 will become 22.6 2 million um, at the first interim. And so that was a question that we just wanted to make sure we addressed. Thank Let you, Joshua. Sure. Appreciate it. All right. Um, I'm going to stop sharing this because we do have a little bit of a presentation left, and then we can always come back to it if we need to. But I will go back to sharing the other portion of the presentation. And I'm not sure why it keeps closing out on me, but I guess we're going to do this again. And Is that, is everybody can see this again? No, I think you have to select your other um, document again. Stop sharing and yeah. <laughs> it makes me do it twice. It's kind of hard. Okay. Now, I think you can see it, right? Yes. Good. That's funny. You have to do it twice. Okay. So um, that was the, what we call the multi-year projection. And so um, we'll skip this because this is all of those pieces that we just got through talking about. Um, this is the local control funding formula calc calculator or calc calculation. Um, we did talk about this in, in the um, May revise as well. So this is a, a, excuse me, not the May revise, apologize, in the revision of the 45 day um, on the budget. Um, and basically we've talked about this many, many times. I think you folks know the components and how it really actually gets calculated and what have you. But one of the things that we always look at to see is um, where are we at as a, as a basic aid, as a basic aid district and we're at the 13, 13 point, um, $13,240,069. So what is next for 1920? Um, we have a new audit firm from uh, I Bailey um, LLP. They will audit the 2019 unaudited actuals in September of 2020. Um, we have a draft audit report and will be reviewed by the FOC, um, by our FOC, our Financial Oversight Committee, um, in November and December of 2020. And then we have a final audit report recommendation from the Fiscal Oversight Committee for approval by the Board of Education in December of 2020 um, or January of 2021. And with that, we have a hard time getting it to, to move for some reason. I'm not sure why. <laughs> I'm not having a good time with this tonight with technology. I'm not sure what's going on. 
but with that, that's pretty much it. I think the next slide was just going to say thank you anyway. So I think what we can do is go ahead and um, have conversations um, about what it is that you folks might want to talk about. Great. So if you'll just give us the screen back. I will do that. Give me back my screen. Okay. Um, wonderful. Thank you so much, Melody and Gerardo, especially Gerardo uh, coming out on a vacation. Yeah. We appreciate that. Um, who wants to speak first? Questions, comments, Maria. I, mean, I just want to just a quick question because I know you already answered this, but I know that I didn't do it justice when people asked me because I got um, I got texts later on regarding. Remember the um, what was it that amount that two hundred sixty six thousand nine ninety seven amount that was uh, the LCFF MU transfer of property tax to charter school. The legality behind that? Why is it that we have to pay the charter schools this money from our property from property tax? I'll let I'll let Gerardo answer it again because he answered it last time. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, uh, we did cover it in the last meeting, and it was just in about um, that we are required to pay um, ADA for a student. So every student has average daily attendance that follows them to every school district or school they attend. And so what happens is that our students within our school boundaries, district boundaries, are attending a charter school that is within our school district boundary, but it's not authorized by the school district. We did go back and end up looking at um, which entity authorized the new West Charter, I think is the new charter that uh, we had on board. And it is, uh, believe it or not, authorized by the state of California, um, the State Board of Education. And so some um, charter schools are authorized um, by school districts, which we are not one of those districts. And some charter schools are authorized by the State Board of Education, by the state. And so any time that one of our students attends one of the charter schools within our district boundaries, um, we have to pay what we would have received from that student in revenue, which is in the form of average daily attendance. So for prior years, we usually had anywhere from twenty to forty thousand dollars of that in loop property tax property tax because we were only um, only servicing, I think the name is River Oaks Charter School. And then when this new charter school came, it brought um, it served an additional 30 students, an additional 30 average daily attendance. Um, that were supposed to come to our school. And I think it was to the tune of twelve to $15,000 per student. And so when you do the math on that, um, it's around 30 students times twelve to $15,000 per ADA, that equals that additional amount that you weren't used to seeing before. Um, so hopefully I answered that. Um, no, no, perfect, perfect. Okay. Thank you. Sure, glad to help. Do we, uh, do we go through the same verification process of identifying um, where, where people live just want to make sure that it is our it is our student going to that, that charter right school. so that is an obligation of each charter school and it's it's written within their charter um, and so there's their numbers are validated by the Department of Education and it's the Department of Education who actually acts as the pass-through to bill us for those students so that uh, a charter school isn't erroneously charging us for students. Those students and their uh, residents, uh, well, the students are validated by um, Department of Education, and it is the obligation of each charter to validate their residents. But yes, it is um, checked. Ralph, did you have a point of clarification or was that covered by that? Can't hear you. He's muted. This particular item, or oh, I thought you had a point of clarification on the on the budget uh, item that just was being that the charter was not addressed. The char not the charter one. Oh, okay. My apologies. Did you want because Lori had her hand up? Unless you want me to. No, I'll go after Lori. Okay, Lori then Ralph. Thanks, Ralph. Uh, unmute myself. Uh, <laughs> so I, I sent this question to Melody earlier, but I think I want to raise it here because I think it is the question. First of all. I want to say it's great news, obviously, that the unaudited actuals came in, came in the way they did and that we are way, way millions of dollars less in the red than we thought we would be. So obviously that's something to be very happy about. But I think ultimately, um, 
we need to get our arms around what then this means in terms of our annual structural deficit. Um, and so we need to somehow be able to figure out which of these changes are because of one-time injections of money or one-time savings because of COVID and which things are things that are more or less permanent um, and or structural, <laughs> I don't know what, what the right term is. But um, so I, I feel like we have to distinguish between if we can, and maybe we can't do it tonight, but we have to make some educated guesses about what are COVID related savings um, and or losses um, and then what are one time so that we can really get a handle on what is our recurring deficit. And I, I realize this is, not, <laughs> this is not Melody or Gerardo's fault. This is part of the insanity of school district budgeting all the time. Things you think you've got a handle on it and then something happens and you're mil you have millions of dollars less or you have millions of dollars more. And this keeps on happening in, and each time it's a different reason. And so it's sort of like a whack-a-mole kind of game. But nonetheless, we've got to get as, I think, clear as we can about uh, the things that I just, that I mentioned earlier about what's one time, what's something that's going to happen in the future. And to that end, one of the slides, which Melody, which you presented about the observations to keep in mind, they also cut in different ways. So yes, the fact that we have declining enrollment because we're basic aid, that doesn't hurt us. Yes, um, property taxes are the biggest portion of the LCFF determination. So because we're in basic aid and because we live or we are fortunate to have two cities that have very high property tax revenues, we benefit from that. And then there are other things you've got listed that are way more volatile. <laughs> So it's really, it's hard, but I feel like it is, um, it's the task. The task before us is to have you help us identify as best we can what our real structural deficit is for all those reasons I've mentioned. That, that's, yeah, that's great points. Um, and I'm, I'm glad you actually brought it up because um, I, I want to reemphasize that, that we spent six million um, it was six million forty-eight thousand, or let's say six million forty-nine thousand dollars less in um, nineteen twenty than we had anticipated. Many, many times when we go to close the books, and I think I probably said it at almost every single presentation I did um, in nineteen twenty for um, um, a budget report, I said that it's possible that we will close the books with about two million dollars um, to the good that we hadn't anticipated um, doing. And a lot of that reasoning behind, a lot of the, the reason behind that, and whenever I say that is, that there's always those, those variables that we can't control. And that's, you know, vacancies um, that, that are there that we can't seem to, to fill a vacant, a vacant position, you know, high-end positions. Um, another one is that we can't always control how the spending is actually gonna happen one way or another. Um, sometimes um, benefits come in you know, lower than when we thought they were going to be or higher than we thought they were going to be. So there's always those, those types of variables. Um, I know I met, I wrote a really good email to you, but I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, so I apologize if I don't oh, remember what? all of it. Maybe but, I could find it myself. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I would have printed it out. I've got it here on, a, on, my, on my iPhone. Um, and, and then the other part of it is, is if you think about that, so we, we, we came out with $7.5 million dollars um, um, to the good or, or better than we had anticipated, right? Um, and if you took that $2 million off that we always have, have as a variable because we, we don't know what's gonna happen or, or what is gonna happen because we always have to, to um, um, budget conservatively, plus we have to budget in a way that it, when, when we're saying we're bringing on a new teacher, we gotta kind of bring them up at the higher level because we don't know how many family members they're coming in with to go to benefits and what have you and that kind of thing. But if you took that 2 million off of there, um, that brings us to, to what, $5.5 .5 million. And then you take the amount of time that we were out from March to the end of June, 
um, I think it's about 1.6 to 1.8 million dollars if you divided that, you know, that, that number of months to, to, the, to the, the number of that 5.5 million, that's about 1.8 million dollars. That's pretty close to what it is that we spend on a, on a monthly basis anyway on all the other incidental things and that's not including um that would not include any kind of um salaries or benefits or anything to that effect um that's like that additional stuff because we still had salaries and benefits coming out even though we were closed right. our school sites were closed but we still have people working and we were still paying as we are as we are now as well so we think that kind of explains a little bit of that it makes me feel more comfortable to know that most of these, the six million dollars that we didn't spend, a good portion of it was uh, the reasoning because of COVID. I'm sure there's other reasons besides that, but I think COVID was a, a really big uh, factor in that. It's going to be very difficult for us to probably pinpoint every piece of this, as I um, pointed out um, to you earlier in an email that um, we, our staff is just <laughs> they're stretched thin right at this moment in time. So I think it's, we, we can do this. We can look for it. Um, I just don't know how precise we're going to be. Um, we did try to hit the highlights and those were those bullet points that, you know, I, I discussed in, in this budget um, piece and in that, um, in that um, email. And I could send that email to the rest of the uh, rest of the board um, as well, just for information so that all of you get the same exact information. But um, I think those are some of the, the bigger pieces. But I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that this is pretty much one-time savings. This is not something that we went out there and we planned and said, oh gosh, we're gonna go ahead and save and do whatever because we've been doing all these um, budget reductions. This is um, truly a COVID kind of a situation. This is a one-time situation. However, we're sitting in 2021 right now and I got a feeling that we're gonna see this again into next year, depending on how long this COVID situation um, lasts or this distance learning lasts for us. Um, I, I think I was looking at the budget a little while ago and um, within there, our operating costs were, um, yeah, 2 million, the operating costs were $2.5 million less than what we normally um, actually spend. And we always spend that and more. So I would be willing to tell you that's utilities, um, that's those types of things within here. Um, utilities actually was $999,892 less than um, what we normally would spend. And when you look at that though, you got looking at garbage, you're looking at, you know, water, gas, all of those, those different types of things. We weren't, we weren't necessarily needing those. So I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> no, no. That, I mean, so there's a difference, for instance, between, and I'll stop before this. Those make sense. Those are clear to me why that the kind of utility payments that we have normally with closed schools they don't those don't happen but um on the other hand like the um gsh yy numbers coming in higher than we projected does that mean that we think we're going to get more than we projected next year or does that is that just because you know i, I don't know I, mean, I don't know the answer to this that's, that's why i'm asking a question that's a that's a great question <laughs> to get at you know great question Lori. great question i'm glad you brought it up because I, I i had actually forgotten to mention it um, with that on on the gsh why what or why um one of the situations there is that we've been working with the foc and with the the city and one of the things that they've kind of you know um been encouraging us to do was to pull back about two million dollars we tried to do a guesstimate of Okay, we know we're out on, you know, we know we're, we know we're out of um, school at this point in time. We're not inside of classrooms. We know there's no sales going on or anything like that. So we tried to do a projection um, along with them and at $2 million is about what we pulled off. It didn't come to fruition. I'm not sure why. I think maybe the sales tax were actually at a higher rate before we went into March into the COVID situation. So that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. However, you got to think about it now. We've been in it a long time, and the city had been shut down for a very long time. So I'm, I'm assuming that we probably should stay with that two million dollar um, 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 back off for 2021. It's hard to project. You know, it's hard to project whether or not that's true or not. But I'd rather be on the conservative side. And if I was a betting woman, but sometimes I am, I would have thought it would came in two million dollars less. You know. I really would have, but hopefully it doesn't hit us so hard in 2021. So that was a good question. 
Laura, you, you wrapped up, should we go to Ralph? And then I was gonna jump in. Okay, so uh, Ralph, me, then Maria. Okay. Um, thanks, Melody and Gerardo and everybody else. Um, I, I guess a couple, a couple of things. One, um, I think, Melody, it's the actual SACS report that we have to approve tonight, the 162 page document. Yes. Okay. So if you want a motion to approve that, I'm happy to do that even before making comments. It's one of the attachments. Let's take care of that. So there, there's a, I think I can be heard now. There's a motion to approve the report uh, by Ralph, seconded by Craig. Thank okay. you, Mr. Metro, and let's continue the discussion. Okay. Um, so this, I mean, there's, it is a, if you like numbers, it's all a fascinating discussion and Lori <laughs> raised some good points. Um, and I would agree with you in general, we would want to continue, um, you know, with the conservative outlook until, uh, until we know better, like with the uh, GSH and YY funds, you know, why change that? Um, what is the, the extra million, the routine restricted maintenance account? Why, what is that that went up over a million dollars in revenue? I'll, I'll let Jordan go ahead and explain. Sure, that. that's actually um, a, um, for the two RRMA and the um, special ed contribution. Um, the special ed contribution is um, a contribution, but the, the RRMA is an interfund transfer. So when you're looking at it in the revenue section, the signs are actually swapped because it's going in and out of revenue instead of an expenditure. So when you see a million dollars more because it's a black positive number, because it's in revenue, that means it actually, we actually spent a million dollars less. Yes. Um, right. so, that, so that gets a little confusing. And that red number for that same slide uh, uh, for special ed, it's in parentheses because it reduced our revenue, which is um, a, a higher contribution to special ed. So for, so for the RRMA, to your question exactly, um, we spent a million dollars less than what we projected um, because uh, we didn't have as many um, facilities projects going on um, at that time um, through that account, as well as some salaries and benefits for some positions that were vacant. Um, that is actually the state required 3% match to our fund 14. So if you have a deferred maintenance fund, which we do in fund 14, the state requires us to spend 3% of our general fund through that resource, which is the uh, re restricted routine maintenance account. So uh, we spent the 3%, we spent 3.01%. And um, when we adopted the budget back in May, we actually, I think I gave Carrie up in the numbers this weekend or this week, I think we actually started out with um, anticipating that we would uh, spend 3.5% um, from that account. Um, so it, it just happened to be less um, salary, less benefits, and less um, projects going through that um, particular um, RRMA resource 8150. Okay, great, thank you. And then uh, Melody just said that of the unspent other operating costs, 40% of it is just utilities. Um, are there any other big, big nuts in there? I mean, is that, again, is this just strictly one time we're going to end up going back and spending those funds or are there things, you know, in there that are more permanent? I think if we were, if we were probably going to, um, if, if we would have started school next week with our children and our, and our staff in schools, I think that the budget that we have for 2021 is a very um, close budget. But now that we're back into the unknown and we're, we're doing, um, you know, distance learning, it's kind of anybody's guess at this moment in time. So th that's one of the reasonings I, we put that bullet in there. We need to really watch our COVID spending and, and how things are going to be. We probably should have talked about watching COVID period, you know, or um, seeing how we're, how we're, <laughs> how we're coming back. I, I'm almost at a loss of words at this point. <laughs> Apologize. Maybe. If you could break that one out, maybe for the Friday packet. Okay. Because um, you said legal travel consultants, you didn't include utilities and that seems to be like 40% of it. Just so, so we can see the kinds of things that we didn't spend and get an idea of what, 
we may or may not spend this year. Actually, it, actually and I, I will attach this into the Friday letter, but the um, spreadsheet that I showed, showed you, it shows the, the, the 2.5 million, and then under that, it shows all of those um, okay. pieces okay. that are I'll, attached I'll, to that. I'll go back and look at it. Don't yeah. worry. Yeah, I think, I think um, attachment five, the multi-year projection, will be the clearest picture um, of what the change was, um, but we'll include it in the Friday packet. And it's all in um, column H. It'll oh. help you understand that. Column H, well, I, yeah, okay. Well, I, you don't have to, I mean, we have it, I have it. Okay. But, okay. so if we, my other comment is about, is about that, is um, if you would then, and I'm uncomfortable, it's just me, I'm one board member, on the 45 day revision, basically my sense is that we don't know, we don't know the current um, district um, situation because we haven't carried over the changed um, beginning fund balance into 45. So we've got a floating $7 million figure and um, even if it's just, you know, it's unofficial, I, I would like to see, you know, that that um, 45 day uh, revision column completed out, you know, just put those numbers in it, for your benefits, superintendent's benefit, the board's benefit, you know, to, to understand where we are now. Because if we're waiting to de December to come back, then, you know, we've got a period of time where we're, um, we, j we just don't really know um, exact, you know, what our, our situation is. And I, I just feel comfortable if you kind of put that together and, and send it to us. No problem. We, we could actually just go ahead and um, fix that particular column. What we'll do is we'll repost it with, um, with this agenda item so that the rest of the community can have it as well. And we'll give it to you in your Friday letter. As Great. Well. So, so if, if, if I may, I just will, I will um, give you the, uh, the spoiler alert. When we do that, um, to line 76 and update that number as requested. Um, the only thing that will change ultimately, that will only increase your line 84, which is the reserve up to two months. Your reserve up to two months is currently 1.3. So when we add in that 7 million that you referenced, which is fine, that will be the only number that increases, which is the reserve up to two months. So you'll, you're, we're basically feeding that line the balance of what you reference. So I just want to give the spoiler spoiler alert and heads up that that's where that will end up. Why, why doesn't it increase the ending balance? It does. It does. It does. It and does. You're just saying it's we're dumping it into that into the which is fine. I mean we're yeah. trying to build our reserve. So you know here here's where we're doing what we uh, you know what, what we're trying to work towards which is to um, all of this you know, is, is about how we budget mm -hmm. um, based on information that we have so that we're, you know, we're, we're bouncing less and we're able to have the programs we want and have a secure future. And that's, Correct. you know, the building of, of that reserve. Sure, we can do that. Yeah. Which I just wanted to give the heads up. John, yeah. can I jump the queue for a second to just add something to what Ralph said? Jump uh, away. Thank you. I appreciate that. So, Ralph, I had an almost exactly the same comment offline earlier today, um, but in discussing it with John, there's a number of changes that are implied in the changes that were done today that are also going to change things up and down that sheet because uh, the, uh, the tax revenue, because the utilities and we're still out on um, distance learning, blah, blah, blah. So yes, that line can change, but we really do need an overall reanalysis of the budget to get a really good picture. So in some ways, I was anyway persuaded not to make the single change because there's a bunch of other changes that wouldn't be made. So in some ways, making that one change is more deceptive than just leaving it as it is where we know that a lot of things have changed because of COVID, if that makes any sense. So there's nothing wrong with getting you those numbers, but I would also counsel that that number is really not particularly more right than the number you've got in front of you now. Um, 
Well, other than it's, and I think as Gerardo said, it's just, you know, it's going to, for the time being, it'll sit in the reserve. Sure, but, um, but there's also a bunch of changes in other th things that are going to happen next year that would either increase that reserve further or decrease it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, stating that we have 7 million bucks or whatever the number is in reserve for next year isn't right, but it's also not that plus the other seven million it's some other number entirely but I, 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 never mind i thought it was going to be helpful it's not so i withdraw the statement yeah i think ralph are you still going or are you no i'm done okay so i i think to to craig's point you know it it does matter to have a, a document that accurately reflects our, our our um our surplus our reserve because if we are being reviewed by rating agencies or something else, I'd rather have that reserve number clean and easy. So I, I do think there's some benefit to a proper multi-year projection that we could do. Um, we're in a really delicate spot right here because what this budget reflects is that we still have um, budget cuts to make. We still have a structural deficit that's hidden in there, but it's been masked by certain events. So there's two things we have to look at. One what are the one-time effects of COVID? And this is, I think, what Laurie said and what Craig was getting at to some idea. We need to see those places in the budget that are COVID-driven. And then we also need to see the places in the budget where we've seen cuts in consultants, cuts in travel, cuts. Where the cuts that we've made, we have to see that the budget cuts we did last year are working and that are continued. Um, because it's complicated. We have to make changes to a budget that is going to be so in flux for the next six months because of COVID. That makes it incredibly difficult. But by showing the old numbers, by showing the old MYP, what you're showing us is we were in really bad shape. And the cuts we made were to mitigate that, that slide. And then we got a little bit of lifeline from what's happening this year. But it doesn't change the fact that the structural issues are there. So I still think we need to continue with that work. I will say this. I don't want to right size our budget on the backs of COVID savings, as it were. Um, so if we know that we're seeing, okay, so let's say we're seeing, we're expecting a half million dollars in reductions for uh, utilities for each semester. And let's, let's say that we're not in classrooms the first semester. I would rather use some of those COVID savings to address some of the things we needed in our budget. Um, we know that we've made early education a priority for us right now. And the biggest, uh, the biggest thing stopping early education right now is I can't get in a classroom. It, it's not so much the tuitions and everything else, but I would like to see us use our COVID savings wisely. Um, they are one time, they, they are not gonna right size our budget. So if we, if we can identify those areas, I think it'll help us as we make the budget cuts we need to make. It's almost like we're juggling two budgets. It's the budget that's being affected by COVID and the budget that we're trying to create long-term moving forward. So, yeah, I know you guys are stretched way thin, but I think we need to be able to look at, we need to be able to break that information out and we need to know what savings we can expect strictly from COVID. How are we doing with our cuts here, here, and here? And what other areas we need to look at? We, we have to be basically running two budgets within this one budget. So hopefully as we get a little past the first day of school, we'll have a little more time to do that. But I think it's going to be important moving forward to get that done. Um, Maria, you're up. Okay, just I have two. One, I guess I, we saw, I saw in terms of the basic gate, the number that you gave us, we're in the negative, so that means we are. I mean, are we in, in per se stable, stable now within um, you know, uh, basic gate, or are we still in the influxion stage where, you know, we, we have one or a couple more years, or, is, or would we anticipate there will be a lot, little bit more stable so we won't have issues with, with that amount of money in terms of basic gate? And two, um, in response to your, your question right now, or your statement, John, in terms of the monies we've saved because of COVID, part of that money, I, I'm, I'm assuming because Dr. Drotty, you know, mentioned it, that we might have to reinvest that money as we begin to open for, you know, you know, open up like the classroom in money that we'll need, you know, to, you know, to provide safety mechanisms for the classrooms again and for teachers and, and staff and everybody involved. So that savings in COVID will be, again, monies that we need to sit, you know, we'll have to pay out for COVID. 
um, reopening again. So, but anyway, I'm just kind of a question regarding the basic aid. So on, on the, the basic aid side of it, I think what you're asking is, um, are we strong into the basic aid or are we, um, you know, kind of like, are we on that borderline back and right. forth? Um, that's a, to me, I think we're, we're, we're becoming more and more strong in it. I don't, I wouldn't say that we're, you know, we're not Beverly Hills strong, but I think that we're, we're stronger in it because what is it, three years in a row now, we've actually been basic aid at this point. I was 17, 18, 18, 19. Yeah, <laughs> we've been in it. We're headed into our fourth year of basic aid. So I feel like we're fairly strong in it. However, I caution that the fact that it is a property tax situation, we are sitting in a COVID situation, there's a lot of different variables that could possibly happen with property taxes. Um, people moving in, move, moving out, people maybe um, not paying their property taxes. I, you know, there's just so many different things that could possibly happen. So that's just my take on it. I think that, that there's always that possibility we could slip back, but um, right at this moment, I think we're strong enough into basic aid that I, I feel like we're going to probably see it again next year and the year after that, unless something happens that Obviously, my crystal ball is not you know, seen at this point in time either. My crystal ball says the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's because him and I use the same crystal ball. <laughs> we use one of those eight balls. We kind of shake it, say, is this going to happen? And that's not going to happen. <laughs> So we, we still have a meeting to run. <laughs> so before, we, um, uh, are there any of the board member comments on this? I think there's a lot of information shared tonight. Anybody else have anything? John, I just want to, Ralph and then Ben. Where are we going? I'm not sure where, where, if your comments, you know, Craig wanted to be, was going to be cautious about not changing anything right now and letting that money float. And I, I'm not sure where you were. I, 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 think, I, think what, I think what I heard from the board is that we are very relieved that uh, these funds are here, that our deficit is less, that our reserves are growing. But we understand that those, those, uh, those monies are not structural. And I think we're also expressing a need to Melody and Gerardo, uh, the more information we know about what is, uh, uh, what, is what, what is COVID related, what is structurally related, the stronger we can make decisions, especially with Ben, who still has been tasked to make reductions into this year. So we need to be able, like I said, we need to be able to see, it's almost like sliding a thing on the budget to reveal COVID things, to reveal structural things. So we know where the needs are. I think that was the, 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 the amalgamation of board conversation. And that includes the MYP that you brought up, Ralph. Yeah, and we should say that the MYP is really something we should ignore until the next budgeting session, because even if we, however we adjust it, it's still not gonna accurately reflect the situation until Melody and Gerardo do more work. But we know that we're to the better from what we were looking at before today. And forgive me for speaking in acronyms, MYP is the multi-year projection. If anybody was hearing me say that, we, we try not to speak in acronyms. Ben, you had something you wanted to add? Yeah, so these savings, uh, uh, like you said, is one time, uh, is here. Uh, we just have to be very careful. And maybe this is more or less a statement for the community, and just in case people are listening, and because you all hear this from me all the time as board members is that we, we can't tie one-time funds, one-time savings to funds that continue to perpetuate and eat. So, so we, uh, we're, there are things that we need. Uh, we haven't had a conversation about this, but our staff's computers, for example, they are old, they're about to, we don't have a game plan to replenish uh, uh, the computers for our staff. And um, we're already hearing from staff members that uh, that, that they might not finish. They, they might not finish with their uh, computers uh, to the end of the year. So those are the things that we are we are eyeing to be able to replenish. That's not going to continue to eat away at our our, 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 our in uh, in fund balance. So so we we're going to come with to you guys with some of those some of those ideas. Still yes, we Gerardo. Need. I just wanted to make sure I understood um, when we talk about repurposing certain um, funds. Let's say we had a saving in utilities or whatever the case may be, and we're repurposing those for uh, let's say, like Dr. Jody said, staff computers. So that that will ultimately have to be a finite amount of dollars, and I assume that's what the staff, us as staff, will be tasked with because the deficit when we do that either will remain the same or increase. It'll increase. Yeah, and so we just want to make sure that um, 
that we will be tasked whatever that new deficit is um, that will have to be something that we bring forward to the board um, for consideration. Kurt, I, I think I think the key would be if you are if let's let's say we are saving five hundred thousand on utilities as an example. If we do not, if we have no expenditure to offset that, that is a five hundred thousand dollar credit to our our, our ending reserve. Sure. But if we spend that five hundred on a separate item, say technology, it it still is neutral. I mean, that doesn't affect our reserve one way or the other. It's Correct. a neutral event. Yeah, my point is just that that means that we're still okay with holding the same deficit all year long if we continue to repurpose unspent funds. But no, we're not, see, this is not what we're saying. What we're saying is we, on one hand, we still need to address budget cuts for the year. There still are things within our budget we need to cut regardless of COVID. On the COVID side, we need to get a better grasp of where we might be seeing money because if we need technology, if we need more, whatever it's gonna be. Um, and the same thing is, as we get to our next budget, you guys are going to start incorporating some of the, the money that came down from Sacramento. Mm-hmm. It's going to affect what we're doing. So yeah. we need to look at a COVID budget and we need to look at an ongoing budget that will exist long after COVID is gone. Hopefully so. Makes sense. Well put. Well put. Right. On that note, so we have a motion and a second. I'm going to do a roll call vote, seeing no more. Uh, Maria, was that a vote or was that a comment? <laughs> I move. Okay, no, we already moved. Ralph moved oh, it, and I think okay. uh, Craig might have said okay. it. But you, while you're on mic, I'll, I'll vote. talk through to you, Maria. Yes. Is a yes. Craig is a yes. Ralph. And I was the second. Yes, yes Craig was the second. Good. Uh, Lori. Yes. TJ. Yes. Is Oscar. Yes. One, oh, there you are, Oscar. Uh, and I'm a yes, so that is seven. Great. And we were right on time with that budget, with that item. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Melody. Thank you, Gerard. I really appreciate the work you guys put into that. Uh, this brings us to consent. Does anybody have anything they need to pull from consent? He oh. asked cautiously. Uh, John, there are a few public comments on. Oh, that's before the consent. <laughs> no, no, it's after consent. Huh? Well, no, 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 no. I'm consent. sorry. There are public comments, but there are a few comments on consent items. Oh, I thought we decided those weren't on consent. No, no, no. Let me find them again. There are two under consent, and they Thank are both, you. I believe, for the classified item under um, personnel. Right. My question being, mm-hmm. I'm assuming those comments are about the CDS layoffs, and that's not in that item. So that I technically, I thought is there not were others. Consent. Wait a minute. Oh, I apologize. I move consent. No, wait a second. Yeah. Let me look at this again, because I thought. Oh, maybe you're right. I'm sorry. And there was a third one, which is no longer there. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. We'll move those to... to I mean, I, I, if Daniel and Patty would unmute themselves for a second. Uh, Daniel, Patty, I don't want to be presumptuous. I'm assuming that you are here to speak to us about CDS. If I'm... Yes. Incorrect. Okay, so what we're going to do... Hello? Is it me, Patty Daniel? Phillips? Yes, once we do... Oh. Consider- Patty, are you also talking about the CDS layoffs? Well, I guess, I don't know. I was just Patty talking was about the unionist speak because she's in kindergarten. So I was just, can you hear me? Yeah, but Patty, it's not time to talk right now. Okay, so because okay, so I'm going to leave. Daniel, well, I'm going to get right to you once we do consent. Okay, we're going to get right to those comments. Thank you for hanging in. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks so, for coming. So uh, who moved consent? Richard? I can. Do I have a second? I'll second. Is Lori. Okay, so let's do a roll call on consent. TJ. Yes. Oh, sorry, Oscar, see your hand up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have some questions on consent, and I need to pull two items. Okay, what items? Okay, page number 23 of the uh, purchase orders. Um, Orbach, Orbach, Huff, and Suarez, and then on page 29, Atkinson, Andelson, and Loya. So those two law firms, I need to pull those. So I have let's to- just pull the, Let's just pull the POs. We'll do those separately. Okay, cool, yeah. Okay, so we're gonna, so uh, Richard, is it okay to amend your motion and to pull out the POs? Great. So all in favor of approving. Oh, wait, wait. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait, wait, what's going on? Hang on. <laughs> Time out. Did you just get attacked by something? Yeah, no, I, I have a couple of things on consent. You're already oh, I'm sorry, here. I didn't see you. I'm totally sorry, 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 sorry. There was a lot going on. Anyway, there are simple <laughs> things, but um, there's a couple of things. Um, the first thing is, uh, I wasn't even sure who to write this about, but under 2G1, uh, in the PDF of the board agenda, which is what I track, 
there's a number of blank forms. So school or office location, page 76, page 77, page 78. There's blank form after blank form in there. Yeah. And I don't know if those are meant to be updated later or whatever, but I just have this nightmare that somebody's going to come back in five years and say the school board voted on a bunch of things with blank forms in it. So somebody needs to tell me that's okay, right? Because it doesn't actually have any data in the forms. The, Which item? I apologize. Uh, sorry, it's, um, it's uh, 2G1. And in the PDF, it's, as an example, page 76. It's a form without a title, um, but it, it's something to do with insurance or tax IDs or blah, blah, blah. And it may be that in the actual attachments now, they've been updated, but in the PDF, they're literally unfilled out forms. And there's a, three or four of them. 2G1, uh, which, which Roman numeral, Craig? Because I see forms. It's um, you do see it, forms, you don't see forms. I saw them all too and had are we, are we talking about independent contractors? Yes, okay, 2G1I. Yeah, I, I see forms, yeah, forms, but are they filled out? Yes, on okay, on page 76 of the PDF. I, I, I'm not looking at the same thing as you, so 76 okay. doesn't mean anything to me. Okay, let me, I, let me pull up the full PDF. You mean the full PDF that's attached to the agenda? Uh huh. But yes. If, if the forms are actually filled out yes. in perfected version on the website, I'm good. I just, I, I, I use the PDF as the text for the meeting. I just opened every form. They are all filled out. Oh, because I saw this. I had the same issue that Craig did earlier, and I didn't know whether those were attachments to contracts, that they were somehow internal things that we don't normally see, or... Okay. That's I just opened saying. seven attachments on 2G1, and all of them have filled out forms. Okay. All right. I wonder if when the PDFs, um, when the so assembly system runs the full PDF, if the fillable form doesn't come out that way, but the attachments themselves oh, are okay. Oh, yeah, that could be. That could okay. easily be. Okay. All right. Um, and my so second, what else? Yeah, my I guess, you know, and my second one was on 2G4V, establishment of a new classification director of risk management. Um, I don't, we don't need to word craft it here, but I would love to suggest to the board that I, I would like to see wildfire explicitly called out here in risk management. Um, it's, it's a really big health deal. And I believe that this is the person who's ultimately in charge of the planning for that. Yeah. Kelly, do you want to make sense? Oh, well, you know, let's, all right, let's pull it out and then I'll go to Mark Kelly to, to, to just kind of, let's okay. do it properly. Sorry about that. That was 2G4. So we're just going to pull out all of 2G, we're going to pull out 2G4 Roman numeral five. It's actually six. <laughs> Director of risk management. Yeah, it's five on the <laughs> Oh, oh no, it's five. I'm, I'm sorry. It's, it's five. five. Yeah. yeah. Wow. You guys are real. This is not the night to quiz me. Okay. <laughs> sorry. So, Oscar, did you have something else other than the, the POs? Yeah, the uh, independent contractors. Okay. Where's, okay. Let's just, so you're talking about 2G1. Is that correct? Yeah, correct. The Let's just pull all of 2G1. Yeah. Great. So we're now pulling two. We're pulling the POs, we're pulling 2G4 Roman numeral five and 2G1. Yes. Exactly. So all in favor of approving consent, pulling these items. I'll do a roll call. Lori. Yes. Maria. Yes. Ralph. Craig. Yes. Thumbs up. Oscar. Yes. TJ, are you here? Yes, I am. Okay, I am a yes. So, so those are those, consent is moved except for these items. Let's do the POs. I think Oscar said you wanted to recuse from the POs. Yeah, uh, no, uh, yeah, a, a couple of them, but I, I want to have questions on some other ones. Okay, well, we're talking about two I, uh, all right, what's your questions on the POs? Okay, uh, well, can we do the uh, independent contractors first? I was just trying to, I thought the PO would be the easiest one. I thought you were just recusing from that. 
Yeah, I, I, I am recusing, but I have, I, I just had some questions on. Uh, sure, let's do to, Let's go to 2G1, in, approval of independent contractor. What's your question? Okay, so the question I have is, um, in terms of, you know, in terms of the contracts that we're looking at, um, there's one, um, the parent, the parent project. And I mean, in general, I want to, I want to just say that I, I would like staff to, to tell us a little bit about evaluation, program evaluation in general. And then also, uh, why, why are we outsourcing uh, these jobs? Like I think uh, the community liaisons, uh, some of the, some of our staff should be doing these jobs. And, and I, I heard the, the comment, you know, from our, uh, from Chris, um, from SEIU Local 99 concerned about, you know, not, not giving the respect to our workers. And, and I am concerned about that. I want to make sure we're not outsourcing jobs that can be done internally. And, and, and I don't see anywhere where staff is letting us know that, um, that, they, they, that our current <laughs> staff can't deliver the services. Um, that are that are being proposed in these contracts and in these independent contracts. So just in general, I want to see a reason on, on uh, from uh, have staff inform us that that you know we don't have the, the capacity and, and explain that a little bit because these contracts are very small. Also, they're not large contracts, and um, so I'd like our staff to do them internally to to do them you know uh, that um, internally. And then the other question is the evaluation aspect of those contracts. How do we know? Um, if these contracts are multiple years, like if, if, if we've been contracting with these individuals, with these vendors for more than one year, what is the program evaluation? Like what is the impact of those uh, services on our, our parents? Okay. Okay. So the first four, I think the first four items are the parent based ones that uh, board member dilatory is referring to. So Ben or Dr. Mora, Dr. Charlie or Dr. Should we, Mora? Should we just go ahead and put that on a Friday memo or I mean, uh, we can... Well, we we have, a, we have a lot of program, we have a lot of, we have an entire parent engagement uh, framework that we've showed you guys. And I think you guys saw a lot of it. So a lot of the parent trainings and uh, we have a huge one tonight, actually happening tonight with our African-American parents uh, uh, getting um, training on school systems and all that. So we can certainly, we can certainly come back with the framework and, and discuss who does what. And I guess that. the I guess to, to board member De La Torre's question, are um, he was saying are these services that could be accomplished by our existing staff or do you believe that bringing in these consultants was necessary to get what you needed to do for your 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 goals it was necessary to get what we need for the goals uh, and so if, if we can find out like how many parents are being served you know i mean obviously there's a we can have a we have a record everybody has to sign in so i'd like to know how many parents are being served um and then, and then if, 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 the, if these vendors uh, are working with us for more than one year, there should be a program evaluation component. Like we should know that the outcomes, um, the outputs and the outcomes that, that we have identified are being met. And, and so there should be a report you know, to our staff to ensure that you know, those, those multiple year contracts um, are, are meeting you know, the outputs and the outcomes that, that we have uh, identified. So we can definitely do that, um, board member Torres, and, and provide updates. Every single one of the trainings um, that we've provided with Parent Project has um, an evaluation at the end, getting parent input in regards to how they've applied, what what strategies and, and the skills that they've learned within the respective program. Um, so we can compile that information. Um, but I and I will definitely share with you when we have those sessions so that you can also attend the culminating celebration um, of our grad of our parent graduates from Parent Project, which is um, a partnership that really provides families of, of willful students strategies by which to um, develop stronger um, stronger relationships and to support their to build the relationships within the family and to in, in turn support the students learning um, at school. So we've, okay. we've anecdotally been able to share um, through previous presentations, the success that we've, that we've found through these partnerships, but definitely we, we are more than happy to provide additional information and, and share that to the board in, in an additional um, communication in a Friday memo or as we move on through the year and implement these, this programming, um, give an update to the entire board in regards to what input we're getting from families and the reception that we're receiving from them. 
Yeah, you know, the, the, I, I just have a big concern, you know, when I hear staff being laid off and, and our, our, our internal staff, you know, um, there's been concern about these independent contracts. And I just want to make sure that we can, that we can tell, you know, our community, especially our workforce, you know, that we're not outsourcing their jobs, you know, that, that, that this is a very specific service um, and, and, and also that it's being evaluated, you know, that we're, that we're looking at the output, outputs and outcomes. So I hope that, I appreciate that, uh, Dr. Mora. The other question I have is around, what is the role of Santa Monica Police Department in delivering services to immigrant Latino, uh, I'm assuming that some of these parents might be documented or undocumented. And I have, I have a question in regards to uh, how, how involving the SMPD might make it difficult for some of these parents to participate. So um, we've, it's been a partnership in order to build relationship and build bridges between the various agencies within our community. So um, we, as I, as I mentioned, we haven't heard any concerns in regards to families feeling um, safe and insecure and being able to engage in, in these trainings, but we will definitely seek out additional information in, relation, in regards to that piece. Um, but up to this point, we've, we've had really, um, really positive feedback from our families and, and a huge interest in being able to participate in these sessions, not just one, but multiple times in order to build the skill set. So mm -hmm. I can look into that piece as well, it, it, because, you know, I know that that's, that's something that's really, um, that's important. And we want to make sure that families, that we're building those bridges across, um, across our different partnerships within, within our community. Do we have do we have the same uh, services with Santa Monica Police Department in our African American parent groups as well, or just the Latino parent groups? Pa the parent project is open to all fa to any families to participate. Latino, African American, white, any family who is interested in receiving this this um, this service can apply for these can enroll and register for these for these sessions. Okay, so any it's open to everyone and and yeah, mm -hmm. okay. and we, we offer. But let me but let me clarify because I, I was there I've been to some other sessions and it's mainly done for for families with students of all you know all colors that come in all diverse diversity of families there for those um, students for our students have that have been um, in in difficulties and that are on um, probation very willful students is the term yeah, yes. <laughs> willful, okay there you go whatever yeah willful, willful students so, yes so this is where we, we try to engage the families so that they can to be supportive of their of their students so that they could move on and make good decisions mm -hmm. and that's where the um the yeah and it's not like officers are there controlling it they have somebody who works on the staff who's actually anahara who actually has worked with our youth for a long time and she does a really good job of it yeah, so the three besides her and, and Liz, Liz Cruz, who's, who's a mental health um, piece of that, and of course, Dr. Frida Rossi, who, who represented the academic piece in the house. So those three were really positive and really um, engaging together and working with the families. And the, fel the families that, 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 that I saw at the table, the culmination, had a lot of positive things to say. And I don't think it's kept anybody from you know, being involved. And they don't take it and they don't look at it, the fact that it's police involved that they take it negatively. I think it's a whole piece that, that they're trying to, to build community with the police, with the police in Santa Monica. Despite what other things have happened, it, that's all aside, but here we are talking about building community with these families and, and, and our students. And we do offer the sessions in English and in Spanish in order to meet the needs of, of our community um, so that they are able to participate in the language that they feel most comfortable in. Yeah, I saw the contract though said that uh, the services will be provided in English if needed. So that, that, that to me is very unclear. It's, it's, it seems to me that even though you're saying it's open for everyone, um, it's focused on Spanish speaking parents. Is that true? Because why would we have a contract that says we'll deliver a service if needed in English? I'm a little confused. So I'll share with you what, why, why that is, is if the numbers are not there, then we won't be providing the service in English. If the numbers are not there in Spanish, then we won't be delivering the service in Spanish. It's all also um, predicated on our outreach and the number of, of, of participants within the session, right? Okay. So we want to make sure that we are responding to the needs of our community and our families and provide that, that flexibility. Yeah, well, just I, I just want to make sure that, you know, the board hasn't dis uh, discussed sort of how we engage law enforcement. I think that's a more of an upper level discussion 
that we, I would like to engage in, um, in terms of law enforcement delivering social services in our schools, I think we have to just have the discussion about that. So I would hope that we would uh, bring that uh, to the board so that we can discuss that and you all can explain to us the merits of that type of strategy. Because we haven't really talked about it. I'd like to learn more about your, your, uh, your approach. Of course. Yes, that's for sure. Uh, okay, so I, I just want to say quickly on, on this, because I appreciate Oscar bringing this up, because he brings up an important point, which is evaluation. Um, these aren't big contracts, but we should evaluate what we do. Um, mm -hmm. I do want to point out, though, we've made significant cuts in consultants, independent contractors. We, we really carved that out hard. And I don't, want, I don't want the public to feel that Drs. Drotti and Mora, uh, if they need to bring somebody in to provide a service because we've, we've made these, uh, these, uh, these reductions, I, I don't want to hamstring them. But to, uh, but to Oscar's point, which is really important, let's make sure what we're, whatever we're putting, whether it's a $5,000 contract or a $50,000 contract, let's make sure that our parents and students are benefiting. I think that's a very valid point for all contracts. So thanks for bringing that up, Oscar. And we'll address the other issue down the road. I think we're going to have that coming up. Yeah, that, that was it. I just had those. Those were the only questions. Yeah. So Thank I'm going to I'm going to move to. So let's so that's 2G4. No, that's 2G1. So Oscar just we've just discussed 2G1. Are there any more comments on 2G1, which is independent contractors? So I'm going to take a roll call vote for that. Oh, do I have a motion to approve? Craig, second by Maria. Roll call vote. Ralph. Yes. Richard. Yes. I should have waited till you were finished chewing. I'm sorry. Sorry. Oscar. <laughs> Sension. Sension. Uh, Craig. Yes. Maria. Yes. Lori. Yes. And I'm a yes. That's six yeses, one abstention. Thank you. So 6G1 is passed. Let's go to 6G4V, which was the, uh, the health, the, the risk, uh, risk management award. Dr. Kelly, uh, can you address Mr. Foster's question? Sure. I'd love, uh, board member Foster, I'd love to hear um, a little bit more of kind of what you're thinking about in that. Um, given, so this is the new risk manager who, as I understand it, is in charge of making sure that we have risk plans in place for various eventualities. Um, and I, I was just thinking that it would make sense for wildfire to be explicitly called out as one of his responsibilities because there's a great deal of health risk uh, with regard to wildfire in our district. So I don't need to, I don't want to micromanage it. I don't want to give you language, but if right. my fellow board members, um, if you think that's um, something that's appropriate to put in here and my fellow board members uh, all then think that that would be a good thing to do, I think we could just leave you to, to do that, not to hold this up, but to, for you to add it um, mm -hmm. afterwards, considering it passed, if that makes I sense. I see, I see me, Lori, and Richard all shaking our heads in the affirmative. Okay. Uh, I see Oscar, uh, Oscar Maria Ralph. I, I think it's wise to include this, Mark, so we'll leave it to your discretion to, to take care of this. Yeah. Okay. Is that okay? I mean, with the caveat that unless for whatever reason, this is not the appropriate place to reflect the importance of that issue. But again, we trust you and we leave that to you. Right. Yeah. So the only comment I'll say is, one of the things in, in, you know, we had a risk manager that was part of our um, JPA partnership. Um, one of the things that isn't there, and I appreciate you bringing this to our attention, is that person really held the responsibility of training the district leadership in emergency response. And I think that that's really the way I'd like to direct that. I can specifically call out some of the emergencies that typically are aligned um, consistent with our own district experience. Um, but I think that's what I'd like to go if the board is comfortable with that, is about training and emergency response. And, I, th I think uh, Craig and said it best. On Mr. Upton's expertise, because part of why that becomes so important is in order for the district to be eligible for FEMA funding, should that ever become necessary, you have to have um, an emergency operations command structure that includes the incident command. It aligns to the, to the federal requirements. So I, I think that is an appropriate addition to this. Um, it was a past practice, so I think I can include that. So, exactly. And I will share that once I kind of figure out what the wording is. And just know that we will share this with the Personnel Commission, and it will go to the, the finalization of the full job description. It will go to the Personnel Commission at its next meeting for approval so that we can proceed with the hiring process. Good, wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. And as, Dr. as Board Member Foster said, we trust you on that one. Thank you for bringing that up for our attention, Craig. 
Do I have a motion to approve 2G4 Roman numeral five? Motion by Craig, second by Maria. Roll call, Lori. Yes. Maria. Hands up, yes. Craig. Yes. Oscar. Yes. Richard. Yes. Ralph. Yes. And I'm a yes, that is seven. Lastly, the purchase orders. Are there comments on purchase orders or were we, were we just pulling for, uh, just to be on the safe side? Uh, yeah, purchase orders? Yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, on page eight, there's a, a group called Creative Visions Foundation, uh, Creative Activism. What is, what, what is that contract, uh, Creative Activism? Can someone explain that? I have to look at it real quick. Hold on. We might need to, this might be something that uh, Steve Richardson put in because it looks like it was paid for out of John Adams. I don't know if this came through at services. Um, we might have to ask uh, Steve to answer that question. Yeah. Unless Dr. Moore can. I'm looking through it. What, where, um, could you um, identify what piece again? Because I'm, I'm looking at it online, so I'm trying to access It's on that. page eight of 33 of the entire PO list, it looks like. I don't know that object number, if that's FIP or not. I think that I think that's a, 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 a jams program that they did either out of supplemental or something else. But I, I can't I mean it's we'd have to ask uh, yeah. Mr. Richardson to come in and, and answer that. Yeah, it's not it's not it, it's not pressing right now for for my vote. But I just I have a question about that. And the other one is um, that uh, page 15, we have uh, $25,000 for face masks. Is that for staff only or is that for students? Uh, it sounds like a lot of face masks and, and what kind are they? Are they disposable face masks or are they reusable face masks? Uh, I'll, I'll try to chime in here because I, um, I think this is a, a variety. I think it is um, a collection of face masks as we consider reopening. Um, I believe this specific order, look, I'd have to go back and look. But we have ordered a variety of face masks. So our, our school nurses have ordered um, M95 masks um, as part of their, their safety precautions for school nurses, health office specialists, and uh, special education staff that will have direct contact. So this is typically our paraeducator twos or special educators in our life skills classes that will be having direct contact with students on a more frequent basis. Um, but we also have um, ordered masks that have come out of our facilities and maintenance department to, to provide to um, maintenance and operations staff so that they have multiple cloth masks available to them. It is required on the reopening protocol that mm -hmm. they just be able to provide employees with masks. So I'd have to go back and try to put, does yeah, it say- Carrie, I, I, I can't get into the, the, Carrie put on the Friday memo a, a spreadsheet of all the purchases. And this was a variety of all different kinds of masks for what you were talking about, Dr. Kelly. It was face mask, it was the, the, the 95s, it was the, oh, Carrie, wonderful. Woo. Yeah. Oh, now you're muted, Carrie. Muted. I'm unmuted. I'm unmuted. Okay, great. Hi. Uh, yes, these specifically are cloth covered reuse cloth reusable masks that will be used by the classified staff. Uh, so they have multiple masks. So the custodians and some of the other classified members looked at them, reviewed them, so they would have better quality masks because we're to supply those for our staff members. Okay, great. Thank you. And then the, the other uh, question, uh, the McCarthy Holdings, it's a lot of money, $18 million on page 22. I'm assuming that's something to do with the bonds and all that, but yes. it's on it. yeah. I think that's construction. Yeah. Carrie, maybe you can. Carrie, you still there? You're muted. You're muted. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let me get there. Um, it is a bond expenditure. That's not our out of, uh, tw fund twenty one point seven. It's the bond. 
Yeah, and McCarthy is our contractor that is working with us um, on both the uh, Discovery Building and the new Exploration Building. So this is a modification to their contract. And then the oh, one other thing, this, uh, page 10, Santa Monica City Bill Collections. Uh, I, I don't recall ever seeing that. What, 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 what is that, Santa Monica Bill Collections? We owe them money or, or we failed to pay them? <laughs> <laughs> going on there. So that's just the, this is Gerardo, that's just the way they title um, their vendor name. Uh, we actually pay for some pass-through utilities from them. And so I believe, um, yeah, those object codes 5530, 5570, those are all for our pass-through utilities, um, such as water, I think is one. Actually, that's the only one. These are all for water. Oh, okay. Water. Yeah. And then to your question earlier about the um, uh, page eight, I think it was for Steve Richardson, that was purchased through his discretionary funds, through his stretch grant. So I think if we needed a more explanation on what that vendor was, we probably would need to contact him directly. Yes, okay, that sounds great. I would like to get a copy of that contract just to understand. And, and, and what we talked about earlier, I wanna make sure every independent contract gets evaluated, that program evaluation becomes a part of the culture of our contracting uh, process and protocols. And, and that's it, those are the only ones. Uh, uh, John, the, uh, the two items that I wanna pull is uh, item uh, page 23, Orbach, Orbach, Huff, and Suarez, and page 29, Atkinson, Andelson, and Loya. And it's, probably, it's probably just as easy, Oscar, if, if, we, uh, if we move the POs, and if you just wanna abstain, it might be the easiest way to go. All right, that's just pulling up. All right. If you're still with that. All right, Great, cool. thanks. Um, so do I have a motion to approve the POs? By totally. Lori, seconded by Ralph. Do a roll call vote, Lori? Yes. Maria? Yes. Ralph? Yes. Craig? Yes. Richard? Yes. Oscar? <clears throat> abstention. Abstention. Okay, and I am a yes. So that's six with one abstention. Okay, so we have now finished consent. All right, good. We got it. Now we go to public comment. Sorry, thank, thank you all for waiting. Sometimes the sausage making takes longer. So, Lori, if you can go to general public comment, please. Yeah, I think we have nine public comments. So I just want to remind all of you who have signed up to make a public comment that these are all presumably on items that are not scheduled on our agenda. So we can't take any action and we can't really discuss your comments with you because they're not agendized. Um, so with that, um, I will name three people at a time. You each have three minutes to address the board. Um, the first name is Amy Keplin or Copeland, and then Linda Greenberg and Diana Maruri. I'm not seeing Amy on the list unless her name is coming up as something else. Is there Amy on the line? I don't hear anything. Uh, well, let's just hold on to her for later. Let's go with Linda Greenberg, followed by Diana Maruri, and then Jane Schmitz. Good evening. I just want to thank all of the teachers, staff, and administrators who planned and executed a much more robust schedule for the start of this school year. Sarah, I heard your comments earlier this evening, but I came tonight to share what I am hearing from parents. Chris, I heard your comments too. And when I speak about what is going on in the district, I recognize how important classified staff are to the success of our students. Parents are pleased that their children are having more time with their teachers and more structure to their educational day. There is much more synchronous learning happening and that's the number one thing I've heard from parents that they are happy about. Teachers are consistently and clearly setting expectations for online learning. And I've heard that at least for the secondary level, students are for the most part respecting those guidelines. I've heard that teachers have lesson plans organized before class, letting students and parents know what, the, what they are. I've heard examples of teachers co-teaching very effectively. Several parents who spoke with me think the Zoom experience seems richer for students using this model, the collaborative model. At both the elementary and secondary levels, the teachers have been super responsive, working with parents when problems arise to figure out how to best accommodate the students' needs. Teachers have acknowledged the need to connect students to each other and to the teacher. 
the social emotional connection is being addressed and parents feel that is super important. For working families, distance learning is extremely challenging and I'm not sure what the solution would be for parents who work, but that would be the case whether the Zoom time was two hours or three hours or more hours. Little ones especially need guided supervision to learn how to get on the computer and need help troubleshooting problems when there's a technological glitch. I look forward to the district surveys to see how distance learning is for the masses. No one denies we would all prefer in-person learning at schools, exactly what we had pre-COVID. But as long as we have to be distance learning, I think most would agree that the start of this school year was a big improvement over last spring's experience. Thank you again for the professional development given to our teachers and staff to ensure a good start to this new school year. As you know, parents are not shy about sharing how they feel about things. So it's great to hear such positive feedback from parents so far. Thank you so much. Thank you, Linda. Diana, Marie, Jane Schmitz, and then Anna Evangelista. Buenas noches, mi nombre es Diana Maruri. Soy la presidenta de ILAC de John Muir. Soy parte del Consejo Escolar de John Muir, representante de ELCAP, representante de los padres latinos en John Muir y madre de un niño que tiene educación especial. El intérprete va a ir hablando al, al igual de lo que yo voy diciendo. So if you need to hear the interpretation um, for uh, Ms. Maruri's message, please select Gracias por darme la oportunidad de hablar con ustedes. Adelante, Diana. Nada más estaba explicando cómo podían escuchar el mensaje en inglés. Continúo. Sí, por favor. Gracias. No, claro. Uh -huh. Gracias por darme la oportunidad de hablar con ustedes y felicitarles por el excelente que ustedes están realizando. Mi comentario va a durar un poco más de tres minutos por justicia lingüística porque al hacer la traducción tal vez va a demorar un poco más. Absolutely. Sorry, sorry for interrupting. Take the extra time because the translation accounts as twice as long. So take your time and uh, make your statement. Thank you. Agradezco el trabajo que están realizando a través de todas estas charlas de justicia social, de justicia social justicia restaurativa, igualdad, que están dadas por la doctora Mora, doctora Rossi, e incluida con el apoyo que nos ha dado la doctora María León Vázquez. Pero mi preocupación en este momento es saber que hay dinero que se está invirtiendo en cosas para padres. Como acabé de escuchar en el presupuesto, pero realmente la principal en nuestra escuela, John Muir, no pone en práctica todo lo que ustedes están haciendo hacia los padres. Faltando una estructura de procesos y buenas prácticas. Habemos muchos padres de familia que compartimos este sentir. Los correos no son respondidos por ella. No tiene un acercamiento a los padres latinos. He 
hemos sido ignorados y discriminados. Este es un problema que viene ya de años anteriores. Lo hemos mencionado en varias reuniones, en varios correos. Estos temas han sido expuestos incluso con la doctora Mora. Con la doctora Frida Rossi. María León Vázquez. Sentimos el apoyo de ellas pero aún siguen los problemas ahí. En esta época de pandemia, lo seguimos viviendo más aún. La principal de la escuela toma decisiones sin tomarnos en cuenta. Sin considerar lo que nosotros los padres pensamos. Quiero permitirme reenviar correos donde se refleja a lo que me estoy dirigiendo. Considerando que en este momento no tengo el tiempo de poder explicarlo a más detalle. El único apoyo que siempre tenemos en la escuela, John Muir, es nuestra comunitaria. Elena siempre está pendiente y presta ayudarnos a todos los padres. Realmente necesitamos un cambio directo y verídico en la escuela, John Muir. ¿Y a qué me refiero con un cambio directo? Es cambiar al principal de la escuela. Porque en estos años no vemos el progreso en la escuela. Acabo de escuchar a la mamá que habló hace un momento. Y está contenta con, las, con los procesos que están manejando en las otras escuelas. Y sé que esas otras escuelas están practicando las cosas que están haciendo ustedes en el consejo escolar. Eso no sucede en nuestra escuela. Porque yo miro escuelas como Edison. Sus alumnos ya estaban listos el viernes 21 de agosto con los horarios y les entregaron hasta los materiales. I, I apologize, the speaker's time is up. Pero sé que puedo continuar, me mencionó. Yeah, yes, and that was the double of the minutes, so that was a total of six minutes. Mm -hmm. ¿Puedo continuar? I, I would suggest that maybe someone on our staff, maybe Dr. Mora, could talk to Ms. Morari off outside of the context of this because we've already used six minutes and I don't think we're not going to be able to resolve this here anyway. Would that be? Yes, of course. Yes, señora Maruri, um, podría usted, si tiene lo que acaba de comentar por escrito, si no lo podría mandar y entonces usted y yo podemos fijar una cita para charlar. Sí, yo lo puedo compartir y al, al final de todo el objetivo es ese, poder volvernos a reunir y tomar acción en todo lo que está sucediendo. Muchas gracias. Claro que sí, muchas gracias. Por favor, mándenos los documentos. Gracias. 
can I just make a comment here? Because um, we've, we've been engaged, and rather than going to a discussion, but I think it's- Maria, we can't hear you. <laughs> oh. You can't, I'm, I'm unmuted. There you go. Oh, okay, maybe I was just too far away. Um, you know, I've been involved and been with them in some of the meetings for these parents. Um, yeah, a lot of issues, but I think this is something that uh, um, I think that has to be discussed with the superintendent and maybe Dr. Mora and Dr. Rossi in, in terms of where we go from here. There's a lot of issues happening, but I think it's something that we really can't discuss online here because there might be personnel issues involved because of personnel issues. So I think this is something that, yes, I, I do agree with, with our parent, Diana Marui. There's a lot of issues, but I think it's something that we, if because of personnel, we're going to have to take it offline and we'll, we'll discuss it there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank um, you. Yeah, I just have a comment for the speaker. Um, uh, Diana, muchas gracias por, por, uh, por hablar y por, este, to, por tu testimonio hoy esta noche. Muchas gracias. Great, thank you all very much. Um, Lori, who are the next speakers? Uh, next is Jane Schmitz, followed by, I think it's Anna Evan Evangelista. Then Daniel Morales and Patty Phillips after that. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Jane Schmitz, a parent at Franklin Elementary School and the president of the Franklin PTA. I want to speak in support and with gratitude to our principal, Cynthia McGregory, our assistant principal, Sherry Hunting, and our front office staff. Um, and a huge thank you as well to our intrepid teachers. Everything that's been thrown at them, Zoom problems, internet weakness, on and on, they just don't stop in their efforts to reach our children, to reach my children. So when I think about distance learning at Franklin, um, I think of these four words, thoughtful, creative, responsive, and wise. And I just want to share my positive feedback to date. Thank you, everyone, for letting me speak. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure you know that your positive comments are welcome. <laughs> um, I, I mean, critical comments are welcome too, but we don't we don't hear that many positive comments. That was my that was what I meant. Thank you, um, Anna Evangelista, and then Daniel Morales and Patty Phillips. Good evening, board members. My name is Anna Evangelista. I am a parent at Will Rogers um, Community. I wanted to take this time to express my thoughts on distance learning. Though this is not the ideal situation we would all want to be in, I appreciate everyone who has worked tirelessly to make this as much better experience than last year. I especially want to thank the teachers for all they are doing for our students not only academically, but also helping them with their social and emotional needs during this time. I have seen this firsthand as I have daughters in fourth grade and kindergarten. I have seen them practice mindfulness, helping them make connections with other students and creating fun, gays, ga fun ways to keep them engaged. Mm -hmm. I know this is not easy, but I wanted to let them know I appreciate all they do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Daniel, and then Patty, and then Colin and Itsugu. Hi, good evening, everybody. And hello to Jane. I'm from Franklin Elementary also. I'm a child center assistant, classified employee with CDS and SEIU 99. And I, um, I welcome her uh, comments because um, I've grown to know Jane's family generationally. Uh, we've had a couple of her students in our, um, in our uh, kindergarten class after school class. And I recognize the importance of our program, CDS, and providing, um, providing services after school for working parents. I worked for 10 years for the district, five permanent, five sub, and at Franklin Elementary, um, I mean, the district runs the gamut from the incredibly wealthy to those who unfortunately are homeless. I've, at Franklin Elementary, um, last year, uh, it was last year, yeah, they had a Trump fundraiser up the street. And um, one of the schools I worked at, um, Roosevelt, they have parents who are, are coming to school, you know, on the bus and um, frankly homeless. So I really, really respect the diversity in the, in the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District community. 
myself. I'm a, I'm Hispanic and I uh, live in Montebello. I uh, would take the combination of public transportation to three hours to work and three hours back. I really believe in our after school program, CDS. And, I, and while as we do want to stay safe and acknowledge the guidelines, I look forward to those guidelines being enforced safely so we can return to our physical learning environment and provide the services that we know we're capable of giving. Thank you very much for our time, your time. Thank you. Patty Phillips, Colin Anitsugu, and then Daisy Vega. Okay, hi everybody. Um, or oh, good evening, board members and Superintendent Drotti. Um, can you hear me? Because I have a head we can. Okay, so first of all, I'm excited to hear that. Did I hear you, Dr. Drotti, say that the CDS program is um, maybe going to be slated to come back? Did I hear that right? Or it's something about a extend through the day program? I don't know if I heard that right. Anyway, I'm happy if that's the case. And so I am a legal guardian for a five-year-old who was in the CDS program who's now in kindergarten at Roosevelt. And I love the school and I love the teacher. Uh, it's been a little hard uh, with the Chromebooks and the, on the, the distance learning, right? But, um, and I thought I wasn't going to be able to get a Chromebook, but I misunderstood that there are Chromebooks, but there's no hotspots. Okay. Now, also, I wanted to say, I appreciate uh, the teachers having to go through what they have to go through, like, you know, with the internet going down and Zoom going in and out and all of that. So I really do appreciate it. And I, and I love the Roosevelt School. But I really want for everybody to be able to benefit from this CDS program because it was so valuable for me and Harmony. Um, she's a delightful girl and, you know, she misses going back to school. Um, and I know that we need for it to be uh, safe and everything, but whatever we can do to, or whatever monies we can put towards that, that would be great. And if you have any money left over, can we get a debit card for food for the kids? Because those lunches suck. And um, what else? Can you pay the parents? Because it's really hard if you have two or three kids and having to teach them all, I mean, I have, I'm missing out on being with my grandbabies and helping my daughter, and then my daughter's having to help her friends who are able to, you know, work, I mean, stay home. And so she's got a baby, a child, a, a four-year-old, and she's helping her friend out, watch her kid, because, I mean, she's paying like $1,000 a month for three hours a day, you know, so, I don't know. Just help. <laughs> Okay. That's about it. Bring back the CDS before and after school program. Okay. Also, like Harmony, I mean, she wants to dance. She needs to do all this stuff. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> Teach her all these things and Zoom all day. I am zoomed out. I'm oh, I'm a particular. I'm a woman of a particular age, and I need these young women to help me. You know, I need. I'm trying to get to my daughter by eight o'clock so that I can try and you know have harmony here and help her at the same time you know so i just feel so sorry for these young mothers you know and young families that are trying so hard right i'm now. sorry the speaker's time has elapsed thank you bye-bye thank you patty I get to go home now i'm in echo park i get to go to santa monica now thank this you goes before you go yes. say <laughs> it, it sounded like you needed a hot spot if that is true please contact miss uh miss Felipe at roosevelt um, and they can arrange that for you. If you need Ms. equipment, Ms. Was helping. we'll arrange that for you. So okay. you contact your principal. I'm going to go pick up the, her Chromebook tomorrow. Was there some, oh, I love you, Oscar De La Torre. Boy, I'm voting for you again. I didn't know who you were, but I know who you are now, and I'm voting for you every single time, okay? For president, too, all right? Love you. All right, thank you, Ms. Phillips. So, Lori, let's keep it going. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. Oscar's blushing. Let's thank you. I love you, man. Don't let me see you on the street. I'll run you over with a hug, okay? Bye-bye. Gotta go. <laughs> Okay, we have three more speakers. Colin and Itsugu, thank you for waiting for so long. Daisy Vega and then Aria Kromarski. Hello. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, distance learning is definitely not what I had hoped for, but it is definitely better than I expected for online class to be like. 
Um, this is my senior year of high school at Semmel High, and obviously this experience is very different than I had ever pictured this year to be. It's disappointing and surreal, but I know that we are all making the best of a less than ideal situation, and I want to talk about the good parts. I'm currently feeling confident in all my classes because the teachers have been able to properly communicate back and forth with us as students in multiple ways. It comes more naturally to some of my teachers, but all of them are making it work and I am learning the class material. I have observed that students who usually struggle with anxiety speaking in class are speaking up more using our class meetings online and other ways teachers have set up for students to ask questions. And I do like that. Uh, I, don't, I don't mind working offline, but I feel more motivated and connected when I'm with my class. And the live sessions are important because they're the closest we can currently get to in-person classes for now. And I would be really worried about the health of my family and the staff if we were on campus every day in class. It does seem hard for teachers who spend a lot of their time managing disruptions and technical difficulties. There are always these kinds of disruptions in classes, even in person, but they're more distracting during distance learning. And I hope that part improves and everyone makes the most of their online time. And maybe some teachers can be given assistance to manage those parts and please survey students about what is working and what might be tweaked to help everyone. While there are some issues here and there, I think everyone is doing their best. And so far it seems to get better each day as we all adjust. I really hope we can all be together in person soon, but I realize we are all lucky that this is even an option. And in the meantime, I wanted to thank everyone who has made it possible for us to continue our school year and provide some ways we can still see our teachers, interact with classmates and continue to learn. Thank you. John. Wow. Yeah, oh, sorry, Richard, yes. I just want to thank Mr. Enots. I wanted to do that. I <laughs> That's in, my uh, job. <laughs> I'm sorry. I want to take personal privilege and say that uh, Mr. Inatsugu, the entire board is very proud of you and very happy that um, you're finding joy and a happy spot for your senior year. We wish, I wish you the very best. And to your point about surveying, Dr. Drati said earlier in this meeting that he is going to be doing a survey of secondary students to get their feedback in the next couple of weeks. So you'll have your voices heard. Great. No, but thank very you. nice to hear a student voice at this early time in the year. So thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you for staying for so long. Um, <laughs> um, Daisy Vega and Aria Kramarski, and that'll conclude our general comments. Buenas noches. Creo que mi video no está funcionando, pero me escuchan. Que es lo importante. Este, yo voy a apoyar a, a Diana con respecto a la escuela de Jomir, hace años ya mis hijos salieron y el problema consiste. Ya mis dos hijos mayores se graduaron y el problema sigue. Tienen que enfocar porque solo enfocan en las escuelas donde hay donde están este personas muy acomodadas, ricos podríamos decir, y en la escuela mixta que es una escuela de Jomir no están enfocando, se les viene diciendo y se les viene diciendo, posiblemente ah, no están supervisando bien a la principal, pero ella es la que dirige y si hay algo malo es porque ella lo está haciendo mal. Entonces yo apoyo a, a Diana con respecto a, a, a que hagan un cambio verídico y que no se quede en el olvido. Yo sé que lo están haciendo y bueno, Oscar, toma acción. ¿Verdad? Para nuestras comunidades este, mixtas. Es una de las, de, de las cosas que debemos de tomar acción en justicia. Justicia de igualdades. Porque me estaba diciendo alguien que va para fiscal general que llegó a Santa Mónica. ¿Cómo podemos hacer llegar, cómo podemos trabajar con las personas de color? Le preguntan a él, les pregunto a ustedes, ¿cómo han convivido ustedes con las personas de color en Santa Mónica? ¿Sacándolas o ayudándolas? Entonces, eso debemos de hacer un cambio, porque así pasó en, en la escuela este, Grand. Las dos personas que estuvieron de príncipe en, de, en Grand se fueron con un concepto horrible de las personas que estaban en las, en las oficinas y de las personas que estaban dirigiendo la escuela. Yo encontré a una de ellas llorando y me dijo, fue una pesadilla trabajar en el distrito de Santa Mónica. Me dio mucha tristeza verla porque era una buena persona. Bueno, 
uno. Otro, la policía, hay que trabajar con la policía, porque hay policías que han, que han revisado a los padres cuando están dejando a los niños en las escuelas. ¿Por qué? Porque están tatuados. El simple hecho que tengan tatú o que se vistan diferente no significa que son delincuentes. Y eso tiene que parar de la policía en revisar y arrestar en frente de las escuelas. A, a, y los niños viendo que están arrestando a sus papás y revisándolos. Eso tiene que haber un cambio ahí. La internet, la internet está monopolizada en Santa Mónica. Se lo voy a explicar. Creo que hay dos o tres compañías, si no me equivoco, que son las que tienen un monopolio. Tienen que abrir más ese mercado porque hay mercados de, de internet que están regalando el internet por seis meses. Y eso deben de ustedes hablarlo con la ciudad. Tienen que abrir más para que haya más igualdad, más justicia, porque es lo que están ustedes hablando, que es lo que nos falta. Humanidad, ahorita, con este nuevo gobierno, tenemos que ser más conscientes y, tener, y trabajar toda la inversión que están haciendo, que no se quede en el olvido. Así que esos son mis comentarios, gracias. Y están haciendo un gran trabajo. ¿Y saben qué? Me costó una hora mandar un comentario público, porque yo no soy experta. Los niños que están sobresaliendo son de los padres que son educados, que son personas blancas, pero de las padres que son latinos, a no ser que se hayan educado desde pequeños acá, son los que están sobresaliendo. Porque yo no hubiera estado a mis hijos si mi hijo acaba de graduar de la Universidad de Santa Bárbara. Gracias a ustedes, gracias al distrito, mi hijo es un profesional, él me está ayudando y me está apoyando y ha agarrado un part-time para apoyarme en este tiempo con con mis tres niños que tengo. Así que buenas noches, que Dios les bendiga. Gracias. Thank you. Um, Aria Kramarski, and apparently, though I don't have her on the list, Lydia Mararo um, signed up to, or intended to sign up for public comment, so she'll be our last speaker after Aria. Unmute properly. Properly. That's better. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Aria Kramarski. I'm a parent of a freshman and a senior at Samo High. Um, this is not how anybody really wanted their senior or freshman years to begin, but I just wanted to express my deepest appreciation for all the work that teacher, I wish I had a husband mute button right now, but I don't. So I'm sorry you hear him in the background. Um, and I had to take the headphones off because if you couldn't hear. But I just wanted to say how uh, thankful we are for the work of all the teachers and staff and administration to keep our kids learning and keep our community safe. And I can only imagine how much work it was to rethink all of these processes and all of the lessons from top to bottom. And I just want to say that the direct connection that the kids have with their teachers has been so invaluable and such a night and day experience for the spring. Um, I know there are issues and, and I've appreciated the flexibility when we've hit snags of everyone trying to just work together to figure it out. Um, and uh, I know that you're going to be under pressure when the time comes to bring kids back in person. But I've spoken to a lot of other parents and stuff and we've just really been very uh, impressed and appreciative of the way that you've balanced learning and safety. And our, our family's experience with direct instruction during distance learning has really been much better than expected. And I really just wanted to, to share that and say thank you, because I was afraid that you'd hear a lot of complaints, but I really was very heartened to hear all of this lovely public comment. It really has been very unexpectedly really supportive. The school has been wonderful so far. And so I just wanted to say thanks. That's it. Thank you, Aria. Uh, and Lydia, I don't see you, but I know you're here. Um, Hello. You're our last speaker. Thank, thank you so much. <laughs> Um, so, uh, completely no one has spoken about that, but I'd like to bring to your attention that um, our school district uses brown paper tickets to um, sell tickets for its uh, events. And um, when the pandemic happened, brown paper tickets uh, failed to pay us a bunch of money. So the band program at Samoha is out $5,000 the theater program is at 18,500 and stairway is out 10,000. These are funds that our program worked very hard to raise and without which they will not be able to function. I'd like to make sure that when you think about this pandemic money that you didn't spend, that you think that these programs are gonna need this money. 
I understand that the idea has been, you know, I ran all this by the channels and it was reported to me that you guys will try to put a brown paper ticket in collection, but I think there's a good chance that bright paper ticket will close their doors and file for bankruptcy and we'll never see the money. So I want to bring that to your attention and it's 33,500, which is a lot of funds raised for the music program and the theater program. And um, I really hope that you'll be able to address that. Thank you. Thank you, Lydia. Um, so Lori, is that the end of public That's the end of public comment. Okay. Uh, which brings us to discussion item. Discussion item one, uh, consider revising BP 9110. Um, who's kicking this one off? Mark? That would be me. <laughs> I was gonna say this, like this should be Sarah. Yeah. Sarah. <laughs> um, to appearance. About a year ago, uh, CSBA sent out a um, update for board bylaw 9110 terms of office. In the past, um, a board member following an election would start their term the first Friday in December, and which worked out well for the calendars um, because then a, uh, a, the board members would be sworn in at the, the city council meeting like on a Tuesday and we'd have our first board meeting um, that second Thursday in December. The uh, law changed and I believe it was to allow the counties and states to get the certified election results to the different municipalities and school districts in time to give them a little extra time. And so now the terms don't go into effect until the second Friday in December. And that's really what this item is. It's just to change the language in your board bylaw that a, uh, a board member who was elected in November doesn't start their term till the second Friday in December. That's this item. Um, it would come forward for consent at the next board meeting, but at the next board meeting would also come forward. There were some unintended consequences to this that um, now a lot of school districts in an election year are gonna have to have two school board meetings in December because the first interim budget report has to be adopted before December 15th. But the second Friday of December is after that. And so what we'll have to do with the next uh, um, board meeting is to bring this board bylaw change forward for action, as well as amend your meeting calendar so that your December 10th board meeting will be now a special meeting just to adopt the second interim. And then you'll have your regular meeting, which will be pushed now to the third week of December, so that whoever gets elected in November can officially be a board member following that second Friday. So for tonight's meeting, it's just discussing the changes in language to the board bylaw. At the next meeting, that'll come forward for action as well as a change in your meeting calendar. Great. So basically the 10th will be a special meeting just to do the budget and the 17th will be the first meeting with the new board for the mm -hmm. post-election. Yes. Um, anybody have any questions for Sarah before that comes back to us for uh, action? Craig. Um, so I'm happy to move it. Um, and, you know, I had talked with board leadership earlier, and particularly the way Sarah framed this, I think it's, and the way the night's been going, I think it's good to keep this item very narrow. A board item on terms of office led me to want to raise a question I wanted to talk about anyway, which is I would very much like us to agendize the conversation about term limits for the school board. So rather than make a case for that and open a can of worms and potential Brown Act issues, can I just say here in this item, I would like to hear that, yes, we will agendize that conversation for later, and then that'll be the end of that conversation tonight. Does that work? Sure. Lord, did you have something on legal on this, or where are we? Well, I think what Craig is asking is that we agendize some other night a discussion that he wants to have about term limits. So I, I, you know, as we talked about earlier in the day, 
I think to have that discussion tonight would violate the Brown Act, and we don't need to do that. <laughs> right. Um, which is why I'm not making a case. Okay. Yeah, which I, which I really appreciate. Okay. So, so we don't get that too far down the rabbit hole. Uh, your request has been heard. Uh, we could have done it under uh, agenda items, but you've been heard and we will agendize and have a discussion. Thank yeah. you. Oscar. I just wanna, I want, I want to support uh, what, what Craig is recommending. As, a, as many of you recall, in, uh, in the election of 2018, Measure TL, which uh, brought term limits to the city council in Santa Monica was approved by 72% of the voters. So I think it's a, a very important right. uh, agenda item for us to bring back. Thank you. Okay, great. So uh, we have, we have the motion has been moved by um, Richard. Sorry, I just, I'm always open to um, speaking about things. And so I support the, the call for a conversation, but I just want to early in the gate say, I do not support yeah. term limits. Let's not get into the topic of that. I, Let's just say we were going to have a discussion. I haven't that. said anything all night long. And I, you've been very good. My 60 seconds right there. <laughs> right. Thank but I, it's not agendized. So you could, you could, doesn't matter. I said 60 seconds. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I, do, I, I do appreciate the motion in the second, however, it's a discussion item. So we will oh, take the motion so in second. Okay, it's coming meeting. back. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Take the reins here. <laughs> Nothing else we need to do. Thank you, Sarah. Great. Major action item, day two. Sake, please do, yes. <laughs> New resolution number 2002, declaring an emergency and delegating authority to enter into contracts necessitated by the spread of coronavirus and to review of actions taken under BP 2210. Uh, is this Carrie? Unless Melody wants it. She's nodding. She doesn't want it. Uh, I'll be happy to do it. So uh, this is the same resolution that we've already come to you twice with the requirements of the revolution uh, a resolution under our Cupca requirements is that we do come to you every major meeting and ha and ha give you an opportunity to continue this emergency resolution uh, attached to this and also in a letter that was uh, given by Dr. Drotty to uh, President Keene, uh, does list the expenditures. There is a spreadsheet that also shows all of the expenditures we've taken under this emergency resolution. For this particular period, since the last time, we purchased an additional $22,265 in uh, personal protective equipment. We purchased $605, in additional cleaning equipment an additional $57,629.77 in uh, sort of parts and things to support it, which, in, which included uh, uh, kiosks that were our temperature check kiosks for our pre-screening for temperature checks and a significant amount of plexiglass screens that went into our school offices and cafeterias and others. So uh, we can anticipate there will be more expenditures coming in that form. Uh, under this resolution as far as the plexiglass. Um, and we have a few other things around signage that will definitely be coming in. Uh, so until this, continue, until this uh, experience is over, we will come back to you every meeting and ask that you continue this resolution. Great, so this is a major action item. So do I have a, so move it, Craig is, Craig. Richard is moving and Maria is second. Do I have any comments on this or questions? I support the revolution. He did, it was funny, you did say, I, I was like, <laughs> uh, of course you do, Ralph. Uh, <laughs> any other real comments on this besides Ralph's? We're getting giddy, so let's stay focused, people. All right, wonderful, I'll do a roll call vote. Lori? Yes. Maria? Yes, for the revolution. Craig? <laughs> uh, sure, yes. Richard? Is it yes? Oscar? Yes. Yes. Uh, Ralph? Yes. And I am a yes. So that has been passed. Brings us to item three, adopt BP 3515.4, recovery for property loss or damage. Are we staying with you, Carrie? Yes, it's, it's me again. Uh, the CSBA has recommended that districts uh, ensure that we have these policies uh, that allow for um, I'm sorry, that I suddenly read in this policy a phrase that I didn't see before. Okay, uh, essentially what this is, is it allows us to recover for damages and vandalism and other things that are lost. Uh, and it does give the ability for us to 
go after whoever made that damage to uh, recoup our funds for it. Uh, while we have done this activity in the past, we never had the board policy to actually state that this, al this is allowed. Uh, it does also allow for um, uh, potentially uh, posting rewards up to a certain amount uh, that would, you know, it to possibly recover items. Um, for our purposes, uh, after the significant uh, vandalism that occurred at uh, Muir, um, uh, smash uh, a year and a half ago, which was about half a million dollars. And then we've seen continued uh, thefts and vandalism around, um, particularly including the loss and, and theft of computers um, and even a truck. Uh, we, we feel like it's helpful to have this policies to give us guidance on what to do with this. Great, thank you, Carrie. Um, let's uh, see if there's a motion and a second before comments or questions. Uh, I see Maria moving it, Craig second. Comments or questions for Mr. Upton? Seeing none, we'll go to a roll call. Ralph? Yes. Oscar? Yes. Richard? Yes. Maria? Yes. Craig? Yes. Lori? Yes. And I'm a yes. That is seven yeses. Uh, information items, we, uh, okay, you can go to, uh, I don't, not aware of any, okay, I don't see any, uh, board member items, BACs, continuation of public comment, board member comments, um, Maria, muted. Just, yeah, just very quickly, um, you know, we, we've had some, I'm glad that the meeting went off really good. Thank you, John. Um, you know, I was really surprised like one of the comments from parents in the last ones that this meeting was in a sense um, praising a lot of the hard work that our teachers and staff and everybody administration has been doing. It's been a tough, it's been tough going, but I think we're moving along forward. I know we heard some criticism that I think we're gonna look into. Um, so the parents that did from, John, from your, we will, we will follow up on some uh, on, on your comments, but in, in overall, thank you to to everybody that's really put out the effort to our teachers has really put out the effort in supporting our kids. I know him because I've been there with my grandson and as he started kindergarten, and it's been tough for the little ones to to be you know to be on on Zoom for that amount of time. But you know they're gonna they're gonna get the hang of it. They're they're little resilient little kids. They're little and they'll you know they roll with the punches. These little ones do. So thank you to everybody because, you know, for me, um, I, I'm seeing it firsthand with, with, my, with my grandson and, and the work that you all do. And I'm really grateful. So thank you to all. And keep up the good work. We're, we're, all, and we're, part of the, we're all part of the team. So all of us keep on doing what we have to do to make this, you know, um, district move forward. Okay, I've got a couple little things I want to put in here. Um, I just want to say as a board member comment, there was one um, retiree tonight from our classified staff. Um, and in COVID, we don't have as many face-to-face -face opportunities. And I want to give a shout out to Will, my friend, Wilson Moten, who a uh, custodian at Roosevelt, moved to Sam High. Wilson, I don't know how long you worked at the district. I should remember by now, but you've been doing it the whole time together. I want to say congratulations and thank you for your work in SMM USD. Um, so thank you, Wilson. I, <laughs> I, wanted, I also want to say, usually we have closed session, which allows us to do some of the, the board business and privacy, but we don't have closed session anymore uh, together, um, in person, I mean. So uh, I'm going to embarrass everybody, and we're going to wish Dr. Drotti an early birthday, which is coming up this weekend. Um, if people promise to unmute, we can sing very quickly. We need everybody, John. We need the whole... Okay, we're going to unmute, but we're going to do this at a nice pace. This is not a, a funeral march. Right, exactly. <laughs> One, two, three. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Dr. Dottie. Happy birthday to you. I think we need wow. a gift pulse or somebody to help oh, us. Was, was, <laughs> 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 Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy bir
something. I hope you don't. Still we, need to, we, need, we need to bring in uh, Mr. Halls next time we're doing this. Yeah. That was just well, if Colin and that super were still on the. I don't know if Colin is still. You, you're still expecting a change, All right. Kate. On that note, are there any other comments? Because we do have an adjournment tonight. Yeah. Oscar, yeah, go ahead. Oscar. Yeah, I, I want to make sure that we bring back the diversity uh, and hiring report with data. Um, that I know Mark can put together, but I, I, I want to have a more robust report than we did last time. I think we just went really fast. We, we don't know, for example, any of the data in terms of where we're hiring people, where, where we might have some uh, deficiencies in our organization. So I just want to have a very uh, you know, focused discussion on that in the future. Great. I, I hear you. We, we definitely will do that. But just to point out, I, I think that's fine. But just to point out, I don't know which Friday memo it's in. But there is some data in one of the last two. I, I think I think Oscar referenced that. I, I think the point he's trying to make is, you know, we've seen it, but we should have a public public discussion for our for our community, and we can share share how we feel. Did I say that right, Oscar? Yes. Yeah. Okay, correct. So we will revisit that. Absolutely. But yes, it is for the board members. We can go back and, and look at that for sure. Um, uh, adjourning. Uh, we are adjourning our meeting tonight in memory of Mike Donovan a retired teacher who passed away a few days ago after a lengthy illness. Mike was hired in 1980 as a CDS teacher and in 1996 became a teacher at Grant Elementary School. He remained at Grant teaching mostly fifth grade and was known as an innovative and inspirational teacher. His witty humor was a part of many lessons and many will remember his science tricks that would fly across the room. No one will forget the origami desk storage boxes either. Mike was always present to support his students in the classroom, as well as every fifth grade science trip. As a longtime member of the Grant Social Committee, he valued the chance to celebrate and recognize his colleagues. Mike retired in January 2017 with almost 37 years of service. Nancy, Mike's wife, and his friends will be coordinate, coordinating a fundraiser in Mike's name, which will benefit the Grant Elementary School Library, a fitting tribute for a longtime educator. So in memory of Mike Donovan, we will close our meeting tonight and thank you all very much for your work and stay safe and stay well. Good night, everybody. Thanks, Good night, everybody. Don. Good night. Happy Good night. birthday, Dr. Good night, Dr. Good night. 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 Good night.